Welcome, everyone, to a brand new episode of the Jams and Tea podcast, where we spin the jams and spill the tea. Today, we're coming at you with a brand new episode, as we are every week. And we are covering the new album by singer, songwriter, and boy genius member Lucy Dacus. And we are also covering another album, one you may have heard of, by Mr. Tyler, the creator. We are call we are calling we are talking about call me if you get lost the most recent album from the former odd future member wow they're both in collectives I just now put that together but we are also going to be doing other videos as well we're going to do a record club this week which is on Morgan's recommended album which is on the metalcore band counterparts. Uh, nothing left to love. Is that what is that the title? Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I did. And of course, we are continuing our Radiohead retrospective this week. Look out for that episode later in the week. We just put up our episode today on the sophomore effort from the band The Benz, and today we will be discussing OK Computer. We will be so. We have a lot of fucking shit to talk about. Uh, we also it have we uh, we've uploaded tons of shit this week. Oh, part two of our Doki Doki Literature Club Let's Play has been uploaded this week. We finished that playthrough this week, so expect yeah. the following episodes to. Here, here's how I'll happen. describe. Here's how I'll describe it. The first three, it's, it's going to be like a six or maybe seven part series. First three parts, goofing around, uh, having a bit of a gender crisis. Uh, all kinds of loopy, stupid, Relatable. funny, dumb shit. And then the second set of three episodes, four through six, is uh, is um, is like it is Dante's Inferno. Yeah, I blacked <laughs> Where out. Where Tyler is Dante, and we are all Virgil, and we're also anime girls. And also, there is a new series we have uploaded this week. A series spearheaded by the one and only August. He's going over his collection of cassettes, much like like a vinyl <clears throat> video thing. So go ahead. Those are short little videos that are going to be uploaded every week. Go check those out. We're, we're going to develop a playlist yeah. where there's multiple ones, but mm -hmm. go check yeah. it out. August talks about Woo! his extensive Bjork tape collection this week which yeah, was, yeah. Fucking, uh, i was a very, little i was a little jealous dope. not even gonna lie i'm like i kind of want to listen to medulla on cassette sounds dope yeah, sure, yeah and we and can the cool do that part sometime. of that cool part of that series is, is like and it's something that even i forgot is how cool cassette artwork is like they yeah really like the properly, vespertine one was kind of cool wasn't it yeah that they really like sick. properly you know pack a lot into that folded sleeve that they um <laughs> that you get in a cassette tape and, and it's an underappreciated art in today's world. Yeah. All right. But um, unless we have anything else to plug, the first thing that we normally do on this podcast is we talk about uh, what we've been listening to for the past week outside of what we are planning to actually review and videos for this podcast. So Jake, what have you been listening to this week? A fucking lot, actually. Um, first, I'm going to assume the identity of my fellow podcast member, August, and I am going to say I listened to my first album by one Mr. Frank Zappa. Yeah. Uh, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Let's Technically, go. Uh, uh, under the Mothers of Invention name, oh, uh, sure. I listened to Freak Out. Oh, um, and appropriate. Freak Out is a fucking ride. It's a very, very fun album. Um, I heard like the first song on it and I was listening to it and I was just like, the production on this song is so fucking good. How is this this old? And it kind of just carries throughout the entire record of just being like, yeah. God damn, this guy knew what he was fucking doing. It's just Hell a very yeah. fun kind of psychedelic sort of that like Southern late 60s, early 70s rock that's just like, it's real meat and potato shit, but it's also got this really, you know, obviously you have Frank Zappa, who's this legendary rock persona, and he's got this really strange sense of humor, and the songs are fucking weird, and, you know, 
maybe not all of them hit or whatever, but it is a consistent listen. It's a bit long, but I definitely enjoyed my time with it. It was very, very good. And I'm going to check out other albums from, uh, I had listened to, I think like Apostrophe like a couple of years ago and really liked that album. But now I'm just like, I need to go back and listen to like Mothers of Invention and then his shit to like properly yeah. develop a like understanding of I, him. I would say that's the way to go about it. Uh, chronological order as ever there are plenty of duds in there especially in that early part of the mother's career but uh once you get to shit like uncle mate and uh so and everything after that you're in for a ride it's awesome i'm far from an, from an expert as well but i will wholeheartedly recommend the frank zappa album hot rats which yeah i, yes, I think you'll enjoy one. more because it's like only six songs and it's more focused and it's just really like a full throttle ride the whole way through it's it's, it's a really great album i need to dig a more movie into for the, your ears yeah as it's yeah. described that's, i need that to dig, dig more like into it shit. but that record i really loved yeah uh and it is jazz stuff has it's is like in its own world within his discography because while i'd say the jazz stuff is all like consistently great at least from what i've heard it's also like only partially representative of him because yeah the personality as jake pointed out is a big aspect of the appeal of zappa yeah totally like if if you like just that sort of like classic sort of like rock sound that he's got it's just like it's so ideal like all the guitar tones are so like warm and crisp and everything is so like but like the musicianship is like second to none like I, I can't believe that this isn't like an album that's like or at least you know that like basically that other albums are like going to progress from that and become like weirder and wilder and more proficient because I'm just like god damn that's some that's some fucking impressive yeah. um but yeah that was really cool um i listened to uh oh i i guess i'll just sort of condense all of this into one little segment but i because of the announcement recently of fucking colors 2 i have listened to the entire discography of between the buried and me which i've meant to do for the longest time but haven't because i had that weird bar for entry where it was just really fucking hard to get into that band for me because I didn't immediately like love them the way that I should have on paper so I had just kind of listened to it and I think at some point when I was listening to like the self-titled this week something clicked in my brain where like one of the most persistent problems I've had with that discography is that I I'm just not a huge fan of the lead singers growling like it always just sounded a little bit amateurish to me and then something just happened where I was just listening to the self-titled and I was like, wow, this doesn't bother me anymore. It didn't change, but it just, I've just listened to it so much that I, I like it now. Is this Stockholm syndrome? Probably. I don't care. I like the albums now. Uh, I updated and gave colors uh, a nine out of 10. Um, that's a fucking terrific album. It just took me a while to fully appreciate it and get on board with it. And I'm really psyched for the new one. Um, I've also listened to like everything they've made. And um, weirdly enough, I haven't, I didn't vibe with uh, Alaska, which is like the other like totemic album in their discography, which I know makes no sense. It's just that album, like once I'm done with that record, I'm just like, God, I feel like I've been put through a fucking washing machine. I feel fucking exhausted, but it's just impenetrable in a way all the other albums I I don't Yes. See, you'd, (laughs) you'd think I would, you'd think, but the thing is, is that the, my, my favorite Between the Buried and Me record so far, Head and Shoulders, The Silent Circus, which is also a pretty hard, like, metalcore leaning record. But, like, that one, I'm just fully on board for. Every song on that album is incredible. No, like, not a single moment of that album doesn't work for me. That's one of my favorite records in the genre now. It's, it's fucking... Mm. Uh, g- give that a whirl, all of you. I-, I I really can't imagine anyone not fucking with it, like at least a little bit. That's it's 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 really good. Uh, also, Coma yeah. Ecliptic is my second favorite, I think. Uh, and ever nobody really cares for that album the way they do the other ones, which is a shame. Uh, that that's like a divisive record in their catalog, apparently. But uh, yeah, it, uh, I I'm not I'm not gonna say don't listen to the Silent Circus because you should because it fucking rules. 
But I just want to say, like in 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 this parallel, Jake's favorite being the Silent Circus is like Jake's favorite Radiohead album being the Benz. It doesn't. It's just like I, I mean, God bless, but okay. I, I mean, I. I can't explain it. It's just I, I've been listening to them nonstop, and that's just where I came down. Hey, what um, what, what diddles your diddly? God bless. And it did carry on. Um, I also gave a first listen to an album I've been putting off. I think just because, uh, well, I'd, I'd mentioned it in the in the group chat a little while ago, but it was a album that I avoided mainly because I heard what Morgan thought about it at first before I even heard about what the album even was. And he thought it was mid at first, but apparently changed his mind. And that would be Casey Musgraves' Golden Hour. Uh, never listened. Um, maybe it's because I've harbored a slight grudge towards her for breaking Rustin Kelly's heart. But, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know anything about their marriage. I'm fucking kidding. Please don't at me. Um, but yeah, Golden Hour is very on. good. Um, yeah, Go- Golden Hour is very good. Uh, I definitely, I'm, I'm probably not in the group of people that's like rapturously in love with it i think it's got a couple of songs that are just like outstandingly good and then a couple of songs that are just pretty good like um i think that like the title track the closer um i have not been able to stop listening to high horse because i mean it's just like hey do you want a pop country disco song and i'm just like no actually i don't and then i listen to that and i'm like well fool me once never mind uh, but yeah, it's a very good sounding record, and I, I think that uh, I'll explore her back catalog because I didn't know that she had a bunch of other albums, but apparently they're very well liked, so I'm, I'm going to try those out a little bit too. Um, but I, I think that like Casey's best when she's focusing a little bit more on the lyricism and a little bit less on hooks, at least for me anyway, because she can write these really poignant, really vivid songs and then like another song will come after it that's just kind of like, it's like good, but it just sort of like bounces right off of you. You're just kind of like reeling from how great the other thing was, but like, yeah, it's a good album. I can see why people really love that one. Um, she's, teasing. Uh, she's teasing a lot that her upcoming record is going to be like a really big ambitious yeah. album. Like it's going to be huge apparently. So I'm very quite excited int- for that because intrigued she's to see a where good, that goes. Yeah, she's a good songwriter, and I really love her voice. She's got a great voice. Um, oh, uh, I listened to Control Denied, uh, which notably is the album of, uh, it's a band that can that uh, Chuck Schuldner of Death, frontman of Death, was a part of uh, before he died. And I listened to that, and I was just kind of like, I don't know why I never got on this, because it's like, it's an acclaimed album, very well-liked album, and Chuck Schuldner is a part of it. Why don't I listen to it? And then I listened to it and was like, I got fucking nothing. This this rocks my shit. Uh, it's it, like, it is the, the easiest thing to describe the appeal of, because it's just like, hey, do you like the last two Death albums? This sounds kind of like it, except it's like with a more very like traditional progressive rock, progressive metal, like singing voice. But like, even thematically, just like lyrically, everything in that totally in keeping with death. I wouldn't say it's like, if I ranked that amongst the death discography, definitely lower half. But that said, if you know what we think of that discography, the lower half of that consists of like two eights and a nine. So mm. also worth noting as well, it's not just Chuck either that's in that band. Steve DiGiorgio nope. is in, plays bass mm-hmm. on that record. Shannon Ham, who plays guitar on Sound of Perseverance, is in that record as well. Yep. Scott Clendenin as well. Like is, that's a if you're into that world of um, you know, the whole scene of like death metal in the 90s, then uh, I haven't heard the Control Denied album, but the pedigree definitely suggests that it's worth your time if alone. Totally. Just to hear those players on another record. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Essential it, listening for any fan of the band whatsoever. All right. My week, though. I'm going to start off very typically uh, with the Mothers of Invention. Their live album and the last of their uh flow and eddie lineup uh just another band from la this album had uh is the best argument you can give me for hating flow and eddie because uh like before i i haven't really minded them i know they're kind of controversial in the 
greater zap of fan base. And I was like, okay, I can get on board with them. But when I had to sit through the 25 minutes of Billy the Mountain, I, I admittedly got off the train. I was like, nope, this, this is too much. That being said, <laughs> the rest of the album is great. It's just, I hate that one song. Uh, Magdalena is maybe the most disgusting song Frank Zappa has ever written at least up to this point in his career, which is saying something. Yeah. He, he can he can go places, and I've only heard one album. Oh, so. boy. This, uh, this, I, you know, you're, you're just going to have to hear it whenever you hear it, because... Uh, Hearing that coming from you, that's ominous. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, and it... And that being said, that song made me laugh out loud because, <laughs> uh, okay. Next thing from the band Metal Church, Metal Church, their self-titled album, a kind of proto thrash uh, US power metal type album. There's some really, uh, really great vocal performances, really heavy, very progressive leaning guitar riffs uh it's got some it, it's a pretty good mix of both phenomenal songs and also song and also like what the hell is this like it ends with a cover of of highway star by deep purple not not like a thrash metal power metal cover just like the band playing highway star in a heavy metal hard rock style and it's like what the fuck why is this here uh but other than that it's a mostly good album uh, although like every hack metal band ever they have a song called the hitman i i swear to you this is something every metal band does they've got a song called like the hitman the assassin or something of the like in their it happens way too often and i'm i'm tired of seeing it Hear that metal bands? August is Hear coming that for queen. you. Hear that queen. You're on watch. <laughs> I listened to uh, a new Opeth record for me. This being oh, yes. Damnation. Yeah. Uh, which I, I talked to Jacob about this. So it's essentially like live tweeting my reaction in the chat. Um, and because it, it, it's one of those moments where like there's a band that you do like love and you can see all of the talent and all of the reasons that they're good and acclaimed, but you don't have the album that's like the one that keeps you going back to the well, the one that's your baby, the one you're like going to someday buy on vinyl and keep close to your heart when you sleep. Um, and then I listened to her best Damnation. Uh, previously I'd heard Blackwater Park and Still Life, I think, and realized, ah, I have that record for Opeth now. Um, just a really wonderful like sonic cry hug you know like mm -hmm. uh like you just had a really bad episode and damnations can't come over and you're like crying into its arms and it's crying too and uh that's what it feels like uh playing is immaculate mixing is top notch it's just such a thank like, you atmosphere. stephen wilson yeah yeah hella fucking hella um what else have i listened to this week i listened to the latest record from one arlo parks collapse and sunbeams if you like the uh, all of the other sort of british uh pop records of this variety uh then you'll like this it's a really wonderful look at sort of what uh, lots of different stories about being in love with like troubled people you know like people with like mental health problems with like racist parents, you know, um, with trauma, you know, and baggage. And it's about how, how does loving damaged people work? Uh, and it, I, I found it a very caring and intimate and affecting record. And I want to recommend it. Um, and the third of three, I, I listened to more, but the ones I have substantial things to say about, uh, I'm ending with, Billy Joel's The Stranger. Which... Let's fucking go. 
it's it's one of those albums where like one member of this chat loves it so much and you're like I don't know anyone else who loves it this much it can't can't be that good and then it is um and this it, is what it, you it get for that. doubting me more good music <laughs> feel bad about it why I got to listen to the stranger why should I feel bad uh, good, about good this? point good point <laughs> I'd get my vinyl but I'm lazy that's okay uh, yeah um it's like of course it's like obsessed with like sort of breakups and stuff but it's such a like uh like half of it is really fun at the same time I mean, it opens with fucking uh, anthony's song which is all yeah bop. yeah uh what's it like uh episodes from an italian restaurant if i remember that title correctly scenes scenes from an italian restaurant scenes from italian restaurant thank you uh-huh. that song laid me flat on my ass what i said i remember song. talking about listening to this and i said that song would and i was right yeah. You were you were correct. Of course, like uh He's Always a Woman has been a favorite of mine since I was a child. I didn't actually know it was on this album. Um mm-hmm. so when that came on, uh I wanted to cry. I didn't, but it nearly happened. It's happened uh, a few times with me. You'll you'll get there. It's fine. Yeah, I'm just sure. <laughs> I uh, but it's it's this uh I also love it has uh, the feel throughout the whole album that like uh his song piano man has of like it's last course yeah. and everyone's kind of sad uh but we're gonna have a party uh, very tom waits closing time hella yeah yeah for mm-hmm. sure uh very semi sonics closing time sorry um but it is <laughs> in a way uh, i mean it's it's a great song yeah yeah it is thank you closing I don't know why time <laughs> I don't know why I said thank you. Everyone loves that song. Why is it like special to love that song? I don't know. But um, I know who no. I want to take me home. It's Tom Waits. <laughs> does Tom Waits <laughs> does shot? Yeah, that could be a gif meme in itself. Like, um, <laughs> yeah, Billy Joel's a stranger. <laughs> it, it's ruined stamp everyone. recommendation. <laughs> Move on. I'm done. We broke Tyler. <laughs> no, I'm, it's okay. I'm all right. I don't it's believe you. Right, um, I, I don't. I, regardless of whether Sosha's finished, I'll say this now because it will fit in the episode more extensively now than in my section. I also listened to The Stranger by Billy Joel this week. Um, and I. I want to spend some time with this. Choose your before. words carefully, Tyler. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest because I owe you that. I need to spend some time with this as an album because I was familiar with so many of these songs just from living uh, as, as we all often are. And, and I have to say that I had a mixed experience listening to this record. And it's not necessarily that I had a mixed experience in terms of like, I thought some of the songs were shit. The songs are very classic songs and they're very beautiful and timeless. Um, but it was one of those experiences where sometimes it's just hit really be- beautifully. Like I, I would say that Anthony's song, uh, Scenes from an Italian Restaurant, Vienna, which I think is a really underrated song. Uh, amazing, oh, yes. Amazing tracks that I fully wholeheartedly love. I'd throw the title track in there as well. It's really good too. But then there's just something about songs like Just the Way You Are and She's Always a Woman that I don't... <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I just need to spend more time with them, but they just, I, it, it felt like they were dragging me into this uh, <laughs> world I didn't want to be in. <laughs> I, 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 the only way I can communicate how this makes me feel is if like, this is like if August showed up on the podcast and was just like, I listened to Fleetwood Mac's Rumors and it was mid. I feel how not Morgan a, would feel if he said that. Not even, no, but like, not even a little outside the realm of possibility. Um, but I specifically that's listen- why I used it because it hurts more specifically yeah. listening to just the way you are I feel like I am a, a little boy listening to his, fa- <laughs> his, his and his father is, is estranged from the family or, is, or their mother and dad mum and dad have broken up and dad's trying to win mum back and he's holding a boom box outside and, or he's like he's got a rose between his teeth and he's singing just the way you are and it's like it, this, the, the issues I have with the song 
are absolutely not Billy Joel's fault at all. Let me be clear. Uh, it's just it's just this weird, clearly not emotional place that these songs take me to. That is a lot to do with the context in which I've experienced them growing up. Uh, that I need to. I'm hoping I can. Uh, I'm hoping eventually I move past that. But it really dogged down the experience of listening to that record. I'm sad to say. It, I guess it cushions the blow, but the blow hurts. I won't lie. It's just now I'm just thinking of um, a, a Kiwi Billy Joel doing the Say Anything bit with a boombox and playing um, just the way you are. A Kiwi Billy Joel is an image in my head that like missing no comes up when I try to think of what that is. It, 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 like, like, <laughs> that's horrible, like a Lovecraftian like... monster. That's not real. <laughs> don't, don't talk was... about that. I was gonna try to sing uh, "Uptown Girl" in a Kiwi accent, but the I can only I can only do that in the voice of like "Uptown Girl." She yeah. I was going to say "Uptown World." If, if we can bond over um, supposedly controversial Billy Joel takes, I will say that I don't like "Uptown Girl." <laughs> I listen oh, to that song God, a lot. No, like, it's a fucking awful get, song. I'm glad I okay, don't have to hide I get older opinion. and I'm just like, I don't like that song at all anymore. It's yeah. so, it's, he sings it with this inflection where he's like, uptown girl. <laughs> like he's, he sounds like he's from the Midwest and I want to kill him. It's also... Yeah, I get the fucking Midwesterners. Good thing we don't have any of those. Yeah, Shoot I hate on them site. All. Yep. Anyway... I we're, listened, we're really spilling the tea here today. I've, I've listened to a lot of music this week as well. Um, so first thing I'll, I'll talk about is I listened to the new Modest Mouse album, The Golden Casket. Oh, yeah. Um, so any longtime viewers of the podcast will know my relationship with Modest Mouse. Uh, I even talked a little bit about their extended discography when we did our uh, video on the Lonesome Crowd of West. And um, I... Even though I said described an album like Strangers to Ourselves, which is their album they put out before this new one as a total fucking mess, which it is. I think I actually used the word disaster, which is also accurate. That album has some really good songs on it. Like some, I mean, it's 15 songs long and I'd say there's about three or four great songs on it. It's just the lows of that record are just like lower than the remains of the Titanic bad on that album, the worst parts of it. And so the golden, the, the golden casket um, is this weird thing where it, there's not a single song on this record that I really like at all. Oh, no. But also, like, it's not terrible <laughs> at all either. It's kind of fine. Um, so it's the worst kind of album? Yeah, but also, like, th- there's some parts of it that do where Isaac Brock does bring that very Isaac Brock charm to it. It's just a very ramshackle record. It is, it's like... Isaac Brock these days couldn't find a hook if it was wedged up his asshole. There's just nothing <laughs> memorable about this record. It's 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 just really. I, I think that's why he sings the way he does. There is in fact a hook wedged up his asshole. <laughs> I saw an old tweet from like years ago this week that said like uh, I I can't exactly remember what it was. It was like Isaac Brock sings like someone's chasing him around the garden with a hose. Not an accurate. Yeah, but anyway, like yeah, it's uh, it's not a good album. It's 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 a, a very very light five out of ten. Worst fucking album. album art I've ever fucking seen. I'm glad where we didn't end up reviewing it because it would have not been a very interesting conversation like I hoped it might have been. Uh, anyway, uh, another thing I want to shout out due to mutual podcast friends slash frequent guest Zach and uh, also the upcoming release of a documentary by Edgar Wright. I listened to two records from the legendary, I don't even know what genre to use because they've basically made music in eight or nine different genres, but the band Sparks, uh, most well known for their glam rock era specifically in the early 70s one of my favorite records my one of my absolute favorite glam rock albums kimono my house from 1973 um fantastic fantastic album that album's been in my life for a while but i listened to two different records i listened to propaganda which is the album they made directly after um, kimono my house another glam rock record very good not obviously not at the level of kimono but has a lot of great songs on it if you enjoy the music of xtc or electric light orchestra you'll enjoy that record 
and I also listened to, more interestingly, their beloved 1979 record, Number One in Heaven, which was the point at which in their 70s era, after doing glam rock, after doing hard rock, after kind of pivoting genre-wise all over the spectrum, they made a disco album. And it ends up being a masterpiece. And the reason for that is two words that explains the reason for why this Sparks disco record is a masterpiece. And those two words Any are... sense. No, those two words are <laughs> Giorgio Moroder. Giorgio Daddy. Moroder produced this entire record. It is um, an absolute classic of his disco electronic synth-based sound. Uh, it is widely regarded as one of the best things he's ever done. Uh, and I, I mean, from what I've heard, I have to wholeheartedly agree. It is fantastic musically, instrumentally. And what's great about it is it's not just like, this is a Giorgio Moroder album that Sparks are singing on. It is a Sparks album through and through. It is a proper intertwined collaboration in the same way that uh, Low is both a um, David Bowie record and a Brian Eno record. It's exactly the same sort of thing in terms of the way that their approaches to music are beautifully synthesized. Uh, and, and it just has some of the best spark songs ever. It's a tight, lean, 34 minute, six song album. No fat on this thing. It's great. It's awesome. It hits. It's, there's a song about, multiple songs about ejaculating. What more do you want from an album? Oh yeah. It rules. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the last song is, is like, it's called the number one song in heaven, which is the name of the record as well, which, which imagines uh, God jamming to sparks and it fucking rules. Um, Dope shit. Love that band. Uh, excited to dig into some of their weirder albums that are more eclectic and less well-known because they seem like they're a really interesting chameleonic band. Uh, what else do I want to shout out? So we're reviewing the new Mountain Goats record Dark in Here next week. Um, so I've been continuing my plunge into the discography of Mountain Goats, wrapping it up at this point. So I listened to two Mountain Goats. I actually listened to three new Mountain Goats records this week, but I'll just focus on two of them. Um, the first was Goths, uh, which uh, is a really interesting record. I'm certainly glad that I have been doing this discography deep dive in the, in the way that means that I've been able to spend a decent amount of time with each record before moving on to the next one, because this is maybe the least immediate uh, Mountain Goats album in their discography so far. It's a dramatic change in sound. Uh, it, it's it being mostly based on a, around electric piano and um, horn compositions and these kind of really ornate lush instrumentals that certainly have been the band had teased towards and the records uh, preceding it but uh, obviously the famed disclaimer that the press ran with when promoting this record was no guitars but like I mean th this record is leathered in bass guitar for one thing so it's kind of like it, it sort of is true but also kind of misses the point but also kind of does encapsulate how dramatically different this album is this, but the thing that again like with most mountain records a thing that um rescues it or not rescues it because i do like the compositions on this on this um record but the thing that really ties it all together is the fact that john is writing really really effectively he's got a really core cool concept goth culture goth music um the experience of of growing up around that uh and the songs are just fantastic uh andrew aldrich is moving back to leeds one of the best mountain goat songs not a hot take i love that track uh, I also love uh, a number of the deep cuts on that record as well. I'll shout out um, uh, We Are Black is a great song. Shelved is a fantastic song that moves into this beautiful kind of Cure-esque bass part towards the end that I absolutely love. Uh, and the deep cuts on this record as well, like We Do a Different on the West Coast and Stench of the Unburied and for the Portuguese goth metal band, songs that I th thought were okay, but kind of filler the first time I listened to it are growing on me more and more the more time I spend with this record. So very interesting album. Definitely, I would say only check this out if you're a solid Mountain Goats fan, because it's, it's certainly not a good entry point or not a good sort of like idea of record to jump into to get an idea of what they're all about musically. But I, I do think it's a really strong album. Um, I also listened to the album that follows it, uh, In League with Dragons this week, which I think... So I listened to every Mountain Goats record uh, from All Hell Te West Texas onwards. I'm going to go back and listen to the Boombox album, the pre-Mountain pre, pre 
uh, early era boombox records as well. But um, but from All Hail West Texas to In League with Dragons, I would say this is the only album in that stretch that I would call just fine rather than great. It does have some great songs on it. I particularly want to shout out the track Younger, which is this really fantastic, ambitious arrangement. Uh, it's really awesome and, and, and so ambitious. That I, and I absolutely love it. And also the sort of synth pop closer, Sicilian Crest, is just a fantastic pop song that I was not expecting this record to deliver in its final moments. I uh, really love that. Some great deep cuts on this record as well. I'm particularly fond of songs like Possum by Night and Going Invisible too. Um, but yeah, overall, I think this record is a wee bit baggy and, and a bit less consistently memorable in the way that the ones preceding it are. But I also, as I've been immersing myself in the Mountain Goats, you know culture i've seen a lot of i i've come to learn that a lot of mountain goats fans regard their 2010s work generally with um suspicion if not outright disdain and so yeah. i am gonna say that despite my feelings on and leave with dragons i think that i really really love the way the band developed in the 2010s and i i absolutely adore um their progression I also listened to the, you know, Boombox Curio songs for Pierre Chauvin, which I didn't really enjoy, but it's fine. John was just doing it for fun. Um, and I'm going to revisit Getting Into Knives as well before we do Dark in Here next week. So that will be, this is the last time, probably the last time I'm going to mention the Mountain Goats in this segment. So yeah, I just wanted to say that um, still one of my absolute favorite bands now. Uh, and I really enjoyed... Um, I, I, every single record, uh, even in League with Dragons, has given me something I wasn't expecting, um, which has been really awesome. Um, and okay, so last thing I want to talk about um, is I also spent this week in preparation for the thing we're just about to talk about. I spent this week revisiting the discography of Tyler the Creator. I say revisiting the discography. I didn't have a chance to re-listen to Flower Boy or Igor, but those records are quite. Uh, you know, at the front of my mind, and I'm very clear on how I feel about them. But I wasn't, I hadn't listened to the records prior to it um, since I was a teenager. In fact, I hadn't listened to the album Cherry Bomb at all. So that was a first listen. So I want to just kind of condense that. And actually, there's one particular album I'm going to focus on, but I'll sort of condense it into the last part of my segment here and say that, uh, you know, they're not good albums. I, I, I was... <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're interesting you know what i mean there's and, and they're, yeah definitely they're super important as well in a way that it, it kind of difficult to get wrap your heads around if you weren't kind of living through the explosion of odd future in 2011 and 2012 when like they yeah. were the biggest thing basically in uh in hip-hop and in, in terms of alternative hip-hop anyway um yeah goblin and wolf i don't like those records um I was hoping I would warm to Wolf. I, I mean, it's certainly a lot better than Goblin, but it, that record still kind of is just so bloated and so long and so like, and it's and it's like my biggest issue with Goblin is that he was like so clearly leaning into the Eminem thing where he's kind of like doing yeah. the Eminem provocations. And I know that he was doing that intentionally, um, you know, Black Eminem, all that. But I, the one thing I was hoping from Wolf at least was that he would move past that and he almost doubles down on it in Wolf like there's a song on Wolf where he specifically just does Stan except it's him instead of Eminem and it's just like a really reheated poor imitation and it just doesn't land as well at all and there's other moments on the record where it's like he's trying to like clean up his image but also like still wants to say bag it a lot and shit and, and all that sort of stuff transitional like, yeah but so but the record i want to focus on because i think it's the most interesting album is cherry bomb which is a really huh. uh, interesting record um i it's not a good album i'll get, say that right at the front because nah. I, I feel like what i'm going to say next might get misconstrued if i don't put that at first it's not a good album but i like it better than goblin wolf or bastard I certainly find it more interesting to listen to than all of those three. And I feel like it gets compared. I've seen it compared a lot to Jesus. Like it's, it's Tyler's Jesus. Like Tyler's like, cause it opens with this like really kind of like loud, heavy guitar track that has like Cole Alexander and black lips on it. And it's very kind of like affrontive and it's the best song on the record. And it's, it's just like really in your face in the same way that on site is on Jesus. But I think that a better comparison than Jesus 
is MIA's album Maya, where she kind of like purposefully ah. takes certain aspects of her sound, turns them up to like 500, leathers everything in distortion, um, and just completely self immolates. The difference between the Maya album and Cherry Bomb is that the Maya album does things that were innovative uh, and ended up basically creating a new lane in alternative music and leading towards uh, the a lot of what you have in alternative music today like a band like black dresses for instance wouldn't exist in the way they do without an album like maya so the difference is maya's got that going for it and maya is like consistently meaningful in terms of what uh mia is saying about her image and also the actual concept of the record which is government surveillance and um you know a lot it's a really prescient album in a lot of ways even if i'm pretty sure you would all hate it it at least <laughs> has you know at least has a core idea of what it's doing cherry bomb is like it wants to do that it's just afraid to fully commit and i think yep. the the best moments of the record are actually the moments where it, it really does like try to be this abrasive ugly like horrendous unlistenable thing because at least that feels like tyler doing something interesting and like really trying to like like double down on who he is in a weird way and then there's the other half of this record where he tries to like go in a more a soulful direction and it completely clashes with the rest of it and like when, when it comes to soulful tyler if i want that i can listen to <laughs> igor i can listen to flower boy it was I, the dry run for that kind of era yeah I think. E exactly and so it comes off so much less interesting on cherry bomb whereas the stuff where he's really like just go fucking going ape shit and like leathering everything in distortion it it's not good but it, like at least this is something you can't get anywhere else in his discography and it kind of does fit with who he is as a person at this time and he reflects on it a little bit in the album we're going to review in a minute mm -hmm. um but yeah so anyway i just wanted to shout that record out because i almost heard almost nothing about it over the years and i almost didn't listen to it but i'm glad i did because it feels like even for all of it, its faults it is a necessary step uh in tyler's artistic development and mm. it is uh you know an important part of his narrative and uh, and it's like i can see i can see why certain people think of it as his best record or their favorite their favorite of his record and i wholeheartedly believe that those people do genuinely believe that it is his best or their favorite or whatever i can see why i can see the attraction to that because it's like the one that seems on its face the most like outwardly transgressive like it be beats the door down and shit i can see why people are attracted to the idea of that but um this is i guess where i'm at a distance from some of those people as well because while i also like those ideas and i like the spirit of it and i like what it means for tyler i also can't you know i can't that's not enough to make the record when you especially when you have so much else about it that isn't consistent with that and that holds that back from really working fully so mm -hmm. yeah it's a record that i think deserves a more nuanced discussion than it gets especially relative yeah. to goblin and wolf i've seen retrospectives on those albums that are very nuanced and very detailed and great but no one really ever talks about cherry bomb other than saying you know it's garbage or it's amazing and it's like it's it's neither of those things really and no one really talks about why and that's anyway that's yeah that's that and that's my mm. week that, that is how a lot of like online music discourse feels is it's like a mm. look here here's the thing that this may be imperfect but really interesting and then everyone shouts at each other that it's good or bad yeah it's something that's like middle of the road it just kind of like it sort of gets lost in the sort of scene. yeah or it, but even like an interesting way no one really cares yeah uh, or at least a lot of people don't care you know yeah well and good I, choice on picking tyler last though because i think that lets us segue into Beautiful. our first album today. Tyler, the creator, is back. What? Um, so Tyler has actually put out a record every two years, very consistently since he'd begun. I noticed that when diving through the records, he's not missed them. Ever since 2009, there's been a new Tyler record every two years, which is a great, um, which doesn't mean anything, but I just thought it was like, he... I guess if it means anything, it's that Tyler never really slows down. Tyler is always in the process of, if not reinventing, then developing his identity as an artist. 
and I think that's what attracts so many people to him is that he's this kind of really enigmatic figure where you don't really have any kind of idea what he's going to do next or like you know and and that makes him exciting right that makes him one of the most um you know exciting and engaging figures in the world of hip-hop and the lane that he's taken with his last two records is, is i mean no one could have seen it coming i certainly didn't see it coming with uh you know listening to tyler back in 2013 or whenever i first became aware of him but but um but yeah, like his ascendance from underground hip hop figurehead to like mainstream hip hop fixture is like really fascinating and uh, surprising. And, 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 you know, a lot of what has been interesting about hip hop and music of the 2010s can really kind of be encapsulated in the progression of, of Tyler, the creator's discography. Uh, he in going against the grain consistently with every single record, even his own grain, um, he ends up def- redefining the sound of the moment, and and that is so uh, powerful and and interesting. And so here we are with call me. I keep calling it call, call me, me by, by your name. name every time this week. I go to type it in on Google. I just type call me by your name. Call me if you get lost. Um, his newest uh oh, fucking i'm so fucking intoxicated seventh so, album something like that sixth or seventh album and um yet another uh curveball from tyler both mm-hmm. a curveball and a development like this is the thing with tyler is that every single record has felt like both of those things a consistent building of his sound but also a deliberate attempt to skirt around expectations and the miracle of Tyler is that this is the third consecutive album where he seems to have pulled that off universally in terms of appeal to his audience, to mainstream audiences, to hip hop audiences. This is his third consecutive hit. People love this album. Uh, I mean, I have seen some dissenting opinions about it. I've even some, seen some backlash online where people, where people are, you know, like, yeah, call me by you. Call me if you get lost is, is not... You know, it's not all that or whatever. It's no ego or it's no whatever. And that's bound to happen, right? Especially when you're an artist like Tyler at this point in his career, when he keeps like hitting these, having these successful records that are like instant hits because of his name brand alone, um, which is not to discount from how they sound. That's another aspect of Tyler that I'd love to talk about some more is the fact that Tyler has, for the most part, produced his own music. Uh, across his entire discography he's worked with other producers this record has two interesting production credits on it one of which goes to um jamie xx of the xx one of the great producers of the 2010s on the track rise and there's also a a jay versace production credit on the closing track as well but other than that this is entirely produced by tyler it is un film de tyler baudelaire um, which is interesting because Baudelaire is not Tyler's surname, but it is an identity he has adopted on this record that I love to talk about and perhaps theorize the significance of. But anyway, I feel like I've given enough of um, groundwork here. Uh, who wants to kind of jump into this record and start discussing what makes this album interesting and, and what you think uh, it means? I would personally like to go because, I mean... <sighs> I very much share your thoughts on his discography. Like maybe not in like, I I think the only area which we disagree is sort of like basically reverse your opinions on Wolf and Cherry Bomb. And that's where I'm at. But like, I'm somebody who never fucked with his older music all that much. I got on board with Flower Boy because that was a big deal when it happened is that everybody was like, that was the, again, like Cherry Bomb was kind of the first real curveball that he actually threw. And then, you know, it went the way it did and it was received the way it was. And then Flower Boy came along and that's kind of when he, took over the world, so to speak. Um, that said, when I listened to that album, only having heard uh, some of his Odd Future stuff, it was like even more of an abrupt thing. So when that happened and then Igor happened, which I remember super vividly because like, you know, he just sort of like dropped this because like, I'm producing all this, don't like, and he had some weird tweet about it where he was just like, don't go in with any expectations. And I was just like, what the fuck does that mean? So then I listened to it and I've talked about it on this podcast before about how Igor was one of the very few times where I had a insanely polarizing reaction to it that completely 180 with time. And I think that's super indicative of what kind of artist Tyler is. And just from the fact that an album like Igor became as big as it did 
because you listen to that record and it's just like there's really nothing in the mainstream that like it, it's pretty unprecedented honestly like there's definitely bits and pieces of it that you can find in the greater cultural consciousness but not to the degree and not to the boundaries being pushed there so it's cool to have that so I kind of went into call me if you get lost with the sort of idea of like you know I don't know anything about this album but I'm going to expect something that I don't expect so I listened to it and on first listen I was like, all right, I really like this. I think this is solid. Uh, like everything here is like really good, really fundamental. It's not as like out there genre wise as Igor is. It's a bit more of going back to his flower boyish sound, except with a lot less of the bright synths and a little bit more of the distorted instrumentals. He's kind of combining some eras here, but it didn't, at first it underwhelmed me in a completely different way as Igor was just a, such a stylistic departure that it just completely took me off guard and I needed to like grow as a listener to get it. And with Call Me If You Get Lost, it was kind of the opposite problem is that I was just like, I think this is good. I think this is solid. But the, the problem here is that it's not as conceptual. It's not as interesting. It's not the like the behemoth of interest that Igor is because whether or not you like that album I feel like there's no shortage of things to say about it and so initially I kind of dismissed this as being something that's like okay he made his unexpected critical smash hit again but like it was weirder so now he's trying to like rein it in a little bit and make something that's a bit more typical of him which it is but again leave it to Tyler to have this kind of reaction on me is that I, I just, I kept listening to it. And with each successive listen, I just kind of peeled something back more, more and more. And I was just kind of like, I need to sit down and just really understand this album. So the best way I did that was this album, I put it on while driving and I kind of unlocked everything for me. I'm going to make two comparisons right now. And I'm going to get some looks probably from even people in this podcast who don't give a shit about this particular thing. Um, but from people in general, is that the two albums I kept thinking of in terms of the contextual place they exist within in their respective artist discography and how they went about fulfilling that purpose were two records. One is Mad Villainy. The other is My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. I'm not comparing their quality, um, even though I'm decidedly less hot on both of those albums than the vast majority of the music public, even though I still really like them. But the thing that, the, like, the really technical, I can laser focus to what about Call Me If You Get Lost bothers me on first listen, it was the brevity of most of the songs. Most of these tracks, the vast majority of them, are under three minutes. They're between two and three minutes and occasionally bordering on the leaner side of two minutes. So initially it was just like, some of these just don't leave the impression that I feel like they maybe want to. Maybe like I, I wanted a bit more development in these songs and it's even further emphasized by the fact that there are two monolithic tracks on here that are like seven, eight minutes and like 10. So you have those really, really big songs and this, and it's a decently sized album too. It's like 53 minutes long. So it, it's got a weird, initially quite uneven pacing to it if you're just kind of expecting a normal structure. And I can totally see that being the tipping point of why many people on this podcast and many people in general would not get along with it. In fact, when I listened to this, I didn't really pay attention to the discourse around it. I fully expected to be somebody who was really, really into this and then none of you to share my thoughts at all or the music uh, going public at large. But thankfully people have latched onto it in a way that I think is pretty similar of uh, uh, my feelings towards it. And the reason I compare it to Mad Villainy first and foremost is that that's basically a very raw showcase of who uh, MF Doom and Mad Lib are. It's them being quintessentially themselves and they have lots of one minute and two minute long songs. They're just pure raw showcases of why they are good at what they're doing. It's them building their own highlight reel. And that is what I think Call Me If You Get Lost is. It is Tyler basically amalgamating everything he's ever done and putting it into a musical victory lap because Igor was the album that it was. And in a way, he's dialed it back. In a lot of ways, this is more accessible. This is a sound most Tyler fans are familiar with and most hip hop fans are familiar with. But I really think that structure being what makes it or breaks it for you is quite important because it makes it for me. This album is a sprawling, 
like ornamental, but also very rough mixtapey record that feels like it is soundtracking this incredibly opulent and expensive globe-trotting vacation from this character that Tyler is inhabiting. And I think that's an undervalued aspect of his music is that Tyler ever since Wolf, hell, I mean, ever since Goblin really, uh, has been fascinated by portraying characters. He's fully inhabiting the skin of somebody else. And my My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy comparison comes in with, he's sort of doing what Kanye did on that album where he's playing into a perceived identity and then like blowing it up and being like like taking it to 11 being like you know some people think he's this way and it's like I'm going to make a record that's the this one thing that people think about me and I'm blowing it up and that's where this Tyler Baudelaire persona comes from it's something that is very undeniably Tyler but also it is its own thing I think Flower Boy is maybe the closest he's come to just not really playing anything, but Igor obviously had a narrative, it had characters, and he was inhabiting someone, and he is here too. And really, it's just about whether or not you get into the things that he's doing on this record, is that if you don't care for the really sick, very soul-tinged, but very distorted production, whether or not you get into its very strange structure that is very mixtapey, but also it's just these songs, to me anyway, are so good at being of a piece with itself. Individually, a lot of these tracks totally do suffer. If you're gonna listen to like specific songs, songs that would make good singles, songs like Lumberjack, you know, that's a short song. And you listen to it, it's like, okay, this is good, but I want more of it. And then you put it in the context of the album, you listen to the whole thing front to back, and it's like perfect. I, I had this weird reaction where it's just like, I feel like I'm going on vacation with this character, Tyler playing this incredibly histrionic rich kid who's going around doing whatever he wants, getting caught up in the moment, falling in love, breaking hearts, doing all this stuff. And man, I find it enthralling. I find it so, so, so captivating. It's, it's such a brilliant little like mood and aesthetic departure that I really, really enjoy. And it's really just because of how fun it is. Like you can intellectualize all these things, all these elements, but that's why I love the album is that it's just so much fun. I throw this and I'm just like, let's fucking go. There are hooks everywhere. There are little pieces of production, like the fucking piano tinges and lines on something like Corso. Whenever those pop up, especially near the end of that song, I'm like, Ooh, that gives me fucking goosebumps. I love that shit. And um, stuff like the, unexpected detours of things like what's your name which is like very much inflected with the soul sound that he's been playing with you have the sort of brief heavier cuts like hot wind blows where it really shows off how good the features are on this album which not a whole lot exactly but they they are consistently knocked out of the park by whoever is like Lil Wayne shows up on here and he's great fucking I don't remember the name of another guy but I don't like anything he's ever done and he shows up and drops a fucking fire verse um but then there's also moments like like really show-stopping things like sweet and i thought you wanted to dance which to me feel really of peace like the can we still be friends off of igor where it's this really cinematic song that's telling the story of like you know dancing and getting caught in the moment and falling in love and this just like almost bipolar, like getting involved in all these emotions and going different places. And it's just such a sweeping thing. And I think that Tyler did a fantastic job of making an accessible record that is simultaneously still very quintessentially him. Nobody in hip hop right now is going to make an album that's anything like this. And the way that it grows on you, despite feeling initially insubstantial, if you give yourself to it, I think it will really, really yield you a lot of rewards. I have constantly been listening to this. It's been one of the most fun albums I've heard all year. I don't, I've been struggling as to where, whether or not I would say I enjoy it or Igor more because I enjoy them quite similarly, but I have to give the edge slightly to Igor just because of its really more refined and uh, conceptual nature. But that doesn't mean that you should dismiss something like this because it has value. And there, there's just, there's just a lot to love here. And I don't think that the hype is unwarranted. I love that it's a left turn, but simultaneously is also kind of safe. But he, he's just so good and like locked into the current landscape and knows how to fit into it and how to disrupt it so that he comes across as being a very individual voice. 
And yeah, I, I really do think this is fantastic, even though it's very naughty and, and strange and I wouldn't understand, like I would completely understand people being middling on it, but I love it. it. It's one of the, it's like the perfect summer album for me so far this year. I, um, I, that was a whirlwind. Thank you, Jake. Um, I want to. Disagree- I've been preparing these thoughts for a while. I thought I was going to be the only one. No, that's all right. Uh, I actually want to disagree with you on one quite crucial point, actually, hmm. which is that I don't really. I think to a certain extent, Tyler is very theatrical uh, as as part of his the way that he performs. But I don't really. To me, this is the most personal Tyler record I think he's made yet. Um, to me, I don't really think he's playing this character, and maybe he's playing up certain elements of it. But to me, this feels like the most unguarded uh, album he's ever made. And part of the reason for that is that I think Tyler, uh, part of what Tyler wants to express or celebrate with this record is that he, at this point in his life, is the happiest he's ever been. Um, and a lot of this record is Tyler just straightforwardly saying to the listener, I'm incredibly happy and I have these things that I'm incredibly grateful for and I feel blessed and I'm also like conscious of the fact that I could lose it all really really easily and the way he communicates all these feelings to me doesn't necessarily feel like he's leaning into a persona but actually leaning away from personas that he's relied on to express his feelings in the past I think that's also reflected in his decision to include a clip of his actual mother uh, on this album as well um and in terms of the tyler baudelaire thing like that's i mean you could read that i think that's a combination of two specific reference points one being of course the legendary french poet charles baudelaire uh, and the other being the baudelaire children from lemony snicket's a series of unfortunate huh. events shit um, i knew i recognized that name from somewhere and i think what tyler is trying to communicate with this now i'm not i i will confess i'm not terribly familiar with the poetry of Charles Baudelaire but I understand one of the um, sort of core themes of that poetry that at least one of the ideas that Tyler draws upon from there is the idea of 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 exploration of of finding yourself of exploring the world of travel of um, coming into your own self and of opulence and uh which which Tyler at one point says in this record it's opulence baby and um (laughs) that sort of thing and I guess with the lemony snicket thing as well it's kind of like the children the Baudelaire children are obviously famously orphans it's kind of like Tyler shedding his like the things that connect him to um the world he once was and kind of just going to find himself um call me if you get lost this idea of 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 uh stepping out into the world and leaving LA, leaving, um, leaving the US and, 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 you know, uh, touching down on um, going to Geneva, I think is one of the reference points that um, DJ drama makes at a certain point. It's kind of like, this is Tyler finding himself. It's kind of like Tyler's odyssey in a certain sense, in a weird way, but framed as this gigantic party that everyone is invited to, which is an interesting vacation. Yeah, exactly. Like it's this interesting kind of dynamic that, that is so much more carefree than the typical kind of like identity seeking odyssey stories that artists typically kind of paint and that i guess comes back to tyler's kind of just inherently irreverent uh, and playful personality uh it is a huge part of what makes this record so appealing and you get tyler you know and in- indulging himself in so many different ways you get the purposefully awkward flirtation of was your name which is absolutely hilarious you get um what's that initial line he reads when he like sees, he's like you look my, you look malnourished something like yeah. that <laughs> Ooh, you look malnourished it's um, so fucking fun like this album has so many good sharp little like moments like that like the fucking beginning of i think it's like manifesto i think where he's just like this fucking mm. white bitch gonna show up and be like, you gotta say something about yeah. me. Shut the fuck up. Suck my dick. <laughs> and I'm yeah. just like, get him. Get yeah. him, Tyler. But like, yeah, so you get him like right off the bat at the start of the record with like Corso. He's talking about like buying a boat. And then there are subsequent re- re- references on later tracks to being on the boat. And like, so he, he kind of is creating this world where he is indulging himself in all of these like excesses. But 
but not like in a way that is, you know, like the, the path to folly or anything, but just like in a way that like where he truly feels that he has earned the success that he has and he's going to and celebrate it and, and uh, you know, make the most of it and enjoy it and, and all those sorts of things. And I think the extent to a which you- A island of him. But <laughs> the extent to which you'll get along with this record, I think, or like in terms of what this record's actually about, is the extent to which you find that interesting or you find that compelling. And I will say that, uh, I, you know, I, I like this record quite a bit. I definitely think this is in the upper echelon of Tyler's discography. Um, but it's certainly not one of my absolute favorite records he's made. Uh, and I, it's taken me a while to kind of figure out how I feel about it because I've kind of been a bit up and down. Uh, and now I'm kind of like at this point where I'm sort of in the middle of all the feelings I had about it. But I, I, I really love the carefree feel of it. Like I love, actually love the mixtape quality that it has. That's something that should be shouted out yep. as well. Is it's not just that the tracks are short. It's that it's deliberately designed to be like a mixtape. And that's where you have the inclusion of DJ drama on this record. We just landed in Geneva. Dotted throughout the whole thing. He's credited in the album credits as the host mm -hmm. of the album. And which I think is a great way of putting it, right? He is there to welcome you in. Uh, in basically every track he's ad-libbing, he's giving this kind of like performance where he's you know hyping Tyler up and he's hyping this experience up like, like at the start of the record where he's like I'm glad you found your way here uh <laughs> I, get lost. I hope you've been spending your time wisely um <laughs> we was taking oh, the Rolls Royce to go see alligators like he's always I'm, doing I'm this. so glad that like nobody has been leaning into like complaints about that because I think it just completely missed like you can take issue with that in and of itself but it's like they don't acknowledge that that's the real like that that's the intent of the project they just are just kind of like oh well, it's this and I'm just like well I mean it's fun shut up <laughs> well I think what's interesting about it in terms of us being here talking about it is that we've never talked about a mixtape on this podcast before and, and mixtapes oh. are like a very distinct like hip-hop mixtapes specifically are distinct in identity from albums and the thing that distinguishes them one of the, the things that distinguishes them is often like a, a, they are often a place where artists will lay down samples rather than original beats and and yeah. they'll kind of explore with that sort of thing like in that sense maybe the quintessential hip-hop mixtape is nostalgia ultra by frank ocean um but Tyler is trying to capture a, a very sort of similar sort of atmosphere here while creating his own beats, but also interpolating a lot of really classic 80s era hip hop drum breaks and samples. The sampling on this thing is really like eclectic and diverse. And most of it is based in this real golden age crate digging stuff. Like he's really trying to create this like real golden age feel. Like it's like infusing the sounds of like golden age hip hop with the feel of like late 2000s era Dat Piff mixtapes, which DJ, of which DJ Drama was a huge contributor and, and part of that, which is the reason- De La Soul also? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, De La Soul, a precursor to that whole era as well. Like it's all, he's tying together a lot of classic elements that, again, this is where I come back to his innovation. You don't see this these people artists making these kinds of references to these kinds of eras in their music you don't get mm -mm. this kind of sampling happening so, happening so much anymore it's, i think it's very telling that he gets pharrell on this record pharrell specifically yeah. pharrell's work um producing with the neptunes uh with whom like the duo with the production duo with pharrell um was in where he produced like classic records for artists like old dirty bastard and clips um like getting pharrell is obviously a producer uh, who has influenced Tyler Heavy. I mean, you can hear that influence even on the earliest Tyler records. And so I think getting Pharrell on this album is, is meaningful in that way. I mean, Pharrell even drops a fucking verse on the song Juggernaut, which has this, uh, one of my favorite beats on the record. It's really mm. whacked out and strange. It's like a fusion of the Neptunes and also like Sophie a little bit as well. And the uh, yeah. really kind of like clanging sounds of, of it to a certain extent, the kind of stretched um, hyper pop esque um, aesthetics to some of the parts of the main beat on this track. Really cool combination of sounds he brings here. And so, where I'm at is I love that aspect. I love the mixtape aspect of it. Um, but my feeling is that it's almost as though uh, Tyler, like the first stretch of this record from the beginning to Manifesto, I think is great in terms of the consistency of that vibe. 
And what's weird is that I like uh, the track Sweet slash I Thought You Wanted to Dance. I think it's actually probably one individually one of the best songs here. Like obviously it's a two part mm-hmm. track, but it has this really cool reggae influenced beat change. And mm-hmm. there's this really interesting sonic ideas he's exploring, but it absolutely, uh, it's like hammers the brakes on this album in a way that it's been really, I've really kind of struggled with whether it works for me on this record or not. And then you have two skits after it, Mama Talk and Blessed, which again, feed into the idea of the album and are kind of necessary and contribute to the, the things Tyler wants to make you be thinking about in terms of where he's at and what he wants you to, what he wants to communicate with this record, but also kind of like halt it a little bit. And and then the, 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 so the second half of this record, I think, is where I, st- I start to have issues with the record kind of losing its way a little bit. Um, I The song Wilshire as well is a really like, like Tyler's performance on this track is fantastic. He gives this like freestyle. Oh, yeah. He freestyles the whole track, I believe he said on Twitter anyway, in a single take. And, and that's incredibly impressive. And uh, like the storytelling on this track as well for a freestyle essentially single verse it is very, very compelling and and pulls you along but also at the same time it's also this kind of quite staid um song that is compared to some of the other parts of the record you're kind of sitting in this single mode for a really really long time and it halts the feel of the album in a way that uh i think goes against what the best parts of this record execute successfully and that's so that's a weird place that i met with certain parts of this record but overall those drawbacks are minor uh this is exactly the kind of record i would have never predicted tyler would have made but it's really satisfying for him to make for him to really get carefree for him to really show off his production chops in such varied ways and for him to show a lot of nuance as well in in terms of expressing how he's feeling in a way that he would have never really he never really had any kind of this sort of nuance when he was like you know 18 20 making records like goblin and, and wolf and so there's other things i want to talk about in terms of specific songs but i've said enough for now that's kind of the general gist of where i'm at but yeah it's an interesting album for sure for the record i want to say that when you said you disagree with me i must have put something wrong because i don't mean that at all what I really meant to say was that Tyler sort of does a combination, I think, of like everything is, it's kind of like Bowie and then I really think about it, is that there's always a part of it that is quintessentially him, but there's an also an addition that's like part of the personality that allows you to explore a specific structure and a specific aesthetic where it doesn't necessarily add to the character because the character is Tyler, but it adds to the character of the record more specifically. And that's why the whole like Tyler, Tyler Baudelaire thing, it's like that sort of reinforces what that's going for, but it's like, it's not like, he's not being theatrical. This isn't not, Im- this isn't impersonal. The best moments on the album to me are the ones that are the most personal, but like it's an exercise in blending these two. And I think that's the most impressive thing about it is that it blends them in equal measure and is better for it. Yeah. It's right. interesting that um, even though this isn't like a totally conceptual record in the way like Igor is, you know, it, there's still like definitely recurring themes um i would even argue if you want to read the album as like a thematic journey through tyler's life and career up to this point i think there's a lot of validity to that and that was a lot of my experience with the record um and not even this moment where moments where he actually reflects on his real life albums like talking about the background to cherry bomb at one point yeah um like in general, you can see an arc between talking about younger Tyler to the realizations he's making now, especially towards the end on uh, Wilshire, well, sure. one of my favorite tracks of the year, the eight minute opus yes. of an amazing story that is totally affecting. And the way in which he looks at this thing and talks about the way in which everyone got hurt, including himself through his own actions, it, it's, it almost feels- You wanna hear like, the story of how me with, and this bitch fell out? but it always feels like with the narrative of the album to end on such a mature realization as to sort of how you behave is almost like ending it at the point of which especially with his last album eagle being about romance and breakup right Mm -hmm. um it feels like 
without telling you he's doing that. He's led you right up to now, to his last album, to what he's trying to say. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah, absolutely. And um, what I think is great about that first stretch of the record, particularly, is the way that Tyler interweaves between that general you know, opulence, luxury, celebration of his life and all that he's got, and other topics that are tangential to that, but feed into his state of mind as well. Like in that sense, I think the best track on the album is the song Massa, which is a great mean, track. He, he, he's just fantastic. His performance on this track is fantastic. Mm-hmm. A lot has been made of his flows, particularly in his second verse on this track where he gets really, really heated. Um, but also like it, it is both a reflection. This is what uh, search of the song you were alluding to, where he reflects specifically on his prior albums and, and talks about, Uh, in a really candid way, and I mean, this is, I think, one of the most revealing moments of the record, really, where he talks in this really candid way about, you know, how he has approached um, developing his artistic identity, and how he deals with the ways in which people respond to that. Um, He he talks about, like, um, um, when I turned 23, that's when puberty finally hit me. It's interesting that he should say that, because when he was 23 was um, 2014, I think. So after he had made some of his most, you know, Goblin and Wolf and all that sorts of things, like he's talking about how, to, to a certain extent, he says, like, uh, the caterpillar went to cocoon. Like, he, he was yeah. um, still developing not only his artistic identity, but also kind of like, you know, his himself in a way beyond you know, uh, beyond the point where he was like artistically well known. Um, he, I was shifting, he said, that's why Cherry Bomb sounded so shifty. My taste started changing from what it was when they met me. But first impression is everything. I ain't want to let me go. So there you go. He's talking about, you know, how his, his identity changing and his artistic interests and influences shifting uh, almost gets overlooked uh, in almost got overlooked because people were so focused on how Tyler appeared when he came up and his idea identity being cemented in this way. And I think that's why he reacted so violently with Cherry Bomb. And that's why he changed so dramatically with Flower Boy, because he was trying to almost force people to see him differently when they mm. weren't following his evolution, when they weren't seeing him as anything but the guy who made Bastard and Goblin, even as he was trying, even his he was so personally changing and creatively changing. Yeah, there's a really important yeah. line on the record where uh, I, can't, I can't remember exactly, but basically he says like, uh, not like people looked at nuance like an insult or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Um, like like uh, my so, nuance was a nuisance. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's the line. Um, and I, this is so important to sort of the way the whole album talks about him as a figure, you know, mm. um, like, especially like his early work was blunt and you can both read this as like a response to like going com- the complete other way if people want, don't want to think about nuance. And, th- and this is something I've been thinking about a lot in terms of uh, the way people talk online, the way I've seen that, you know, um, something I'd be thinking about before I listen to the album. Um, and it, then, but you could also look at it like, if you actually want to have a conversation around what he was putting in front of people with those early albums, which I don't like, um, that wasn't happening. You know, those conversations weren't happening. Mm. Yeah, a- absolutely. Agree. Absolutely. And, and um, a lot of it is interesting as well, because like, Tyler's biggest audience uh, around the time of like 2009 to 2015. In fact, for most of his career, I think it's fair to say that his biggest audience have been white people, white music people. Uh-huh. Like, and that's something that he has um, both reacted against, reckoned with, and kind of ironically embraced and, and has a complicated relationship with. And now he's kind of at, that's why I think this record is such a kind of breath of fresh air because he's now at this point where he has, um, you know, both conti- both been artistically redeemed in the eyes of the public, um, and also being being widely embraced by uh, wider swaths of the you know music listening world, and um, to the point where he can basically do anything now. And and so yeah, it, it's an emotional experience, I guess, listening to this record after plowing through his discography and kind of immersing myself in his state of mind, because it used to be that when I 
you know, when Flower Boy came out, uh, it was to me, it was like, this was such a different, a completely different person to the Tyler that I remembered um, from that early era. And yeah, and it is like, he again, he's changed, he's evolved. He's, he's the caterpillar went to cocoon, as he says. Um, but also like, he's always been Tyler and, and he's always been complicated and he's always been um, this really, this person who has struggled and, formed their identity completely in the public eye and and purposefully so and intentionally so but but yeah it, it just makes for when the moments where he starts to reflect on himself and his success and what that means and why how that's significant um i think makes for some of the most interesting stuff in terms of him as a writer and as a an artist it's also so like we, I, I do want to say like I, it probably didn't come across just because we've been talking about a lot like thematically and and conceptually and how it's being received and, and all that but like can't understate how this just fucking knocks like I I have been like every time the beat on manifesto really kicks in yeah. and I'm just like what in the goddamn hell is happening in this song but also please do it more because it sounds incredible <laughs> or the fucking like the fluttering like dark synth on lumberjack which has like one of the best song hooks of the year so far where i'm just like oh man get being in the car this shit bumps in the whip is what i'm saying but uh th there's the sort of moments where it'll kind of take back and it's like if you liked igor and like that sound you'll get some of that here if you yeah. liked flower boy you're gonna get some of that here hell if you like cherry bomb you're gonna get some of that here and mm -hmm. i think that it's just it adds to that sort of fun factor it gives you a little bit of everything yeah and and oh again God, it's like that's uh, perfectly reflective of, of tyler as well like it's he's infused everything everything he has done has led up to this point where he is now and so the music reflects that yeah yeah i mean it's like i, I get it i i appreciate a lot of it what it's doing i hell i even enjoyed the odd song here or there uh love even um it's just the the whole of it yeah is not really something that appeals to me or something that i'm really looking for i do really like uh i i mean i like plenty of elements about it i like the more synthy funky elements of some of the tracks sprinkled about here i think those are really interesting influences that, that take from tyler's past two albums and develop on it in a way he didn't even really get to do in those previous albums and i think that could be an interesting career path, but you know, it's not up to me. It's up to him. Uh, I, I'm definitely interested to see how he takes the career, his career, because it, it seems with these, this kind of character piece style with his albums, where he's doing like a, this is the the album about Igor, the the breakup kind of type character. This is Tyler Balderly in the the super Tyler boulder dash yeah <laughs> su the super exuberant rich uh character rich type character uh like i i definitely will be curious to see how that how that character stuff develops and it does give me the idea that if that idea kind of continues on into his career which i honestly have no reason to think it won't and that won't be just yeah the Tyler shtick from now on. I, I do think that will lead to a lot of records down the line being hit or miss even for fans of his music like myself. Because I, I should say, I do love Igor and Flower Boy. Bo I own both. I think they're fantastic albums. Uh, but it, yeah, you know, I... I'm left curious, but also at, a, at arm's length. You know, uh, I, I rest on your face. I mean, I rest my case. I think that's a completely understandable position to have, really. And I, I can't be like, that's just sort of the thing is that Tyler's just really great at simultaneously coming out with new projects that are a risk, but also accessible in entirely different ways. And I think that that's going to like your mileage with all of them may vary. I mean, it's just like, if you don't like the sound of Sonny Igor, you're not going to like Igor, but hey, you might like Flower Boy. You might like Call Me If You Get Lost because it's not exactly the same, but you know. It, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
I, I could never accuse him of like being repetitive at this stage in his career. And I, and yeah, that's of course, I think where that uh, mileage may vary thing comes in. Yeah. Well, a, a song that we haven't really talked about that I wanted to hopefully have a discussion about because I think it's interesting and probably possibly could provide some good discussion fodder is the song Manifesto, which is yeah. a quite key point in this record. Uh, and I think it's one of the most immediate in terms of what Tyler is talking about. He drifts away from, you know, the celebration of blessings or whatever to reflect on um, his basically the obligations that are thrust upon him as a person of color in the limelight, basically. This yeah. idea that, mm. um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement or the, the, the general um, pressure to protest, the general pressure to have take a very specific stance against certain things in itself can be a form of oppression which is a yep. very interesting idea that I don't know if I've heard any artist really talk about over the last you know, 12 months where this has been particularly potent and you've get, gotten a lot of artistic responses to uh, you know, the George Floyd death or whatever, which I think is you know, the, the subtext of this song. Um, so what do you guys think about this notion of that, the, what Tyler is talking about on this song? I personally <laughs> love the approach because it reminds me of a lot of metal in how they explored really taboo subjects and basically they kind of encouraged that whole like the fighting off of the wave of the satanic panic and then afterwards and all the music that kind of like fostered and grew from that is there something distinctly kind of punk rock about it and i love like he gets really righteously angry on manifesto there's a point where he's just like you know why how do you expect me a black man who lives in America and witnesses all this and is oppressed and is taught by this uh, institution that is internalized so much systemic racism that it fundamentally warps our conception of the very world itself. How can you expect me to act normal? Like, why do you suddenly think that I'm going to be this person who isn't going to be weird and touchy and try to get nerves? Like, because he said something really... Um, uh, prescient when he got a Grammy for Igor, I think. And he was just like, I don't like the word urban, the way the Grammys use it, because for me, that's just another oh, he won polite the, white he way won, to say the N-word. That was a really controversial yeah. thing though. He won the best rap album for Igor, which yeah. is debatably not a rap record. Exactly. So, yeah. Thanks. And he was right to be angry about that. And I think it feeds into Manifesto. He's just really fucking like, as much as I don't like those earlier records, and I think they're like, a lot, I think shit like Goblin is terrible, but it's also like, when you look at it under this light, it's just like, that's why I can't like begrudge him about it too hard or why I'm so eager and willing to forgive him for saying and doing a lot of the awful heinous shit that's on those records that I maybe wouldn't on somebody else is that A, he's had an arc, he's, had an arc, he's re reformed himself clearly, but at the same time, he's also just like, I don't owe you people anything. Like, stop trying to treat me like I'm this fucking dancing puppet who's supposed to cater to your incredibly fragile sensibilities. And like, in that respect, <laughs> I identify with him in, the, in that when I'm just like, good for you, you should be doing this. That sort of pushing the envelope has just manifested in a way more artistically interesting way in a more counter-culturally way that like he can both yeah. make interesting music and music that goes against the grain. And also, like, he was a if, teenager if I, when he did most of those things that people, like, mm -hmm. that, that made his most controversial music as well, like, and, and he does talk specifically in this song about, you know, the the, the idea of him being cancelled, like, the people who have tried to kind of come after <laughs> him and, you know, reduce his stature for things that he's said, and the kind of hypocrisy inherent yeah. in a lot of the way that that is carried out. Which happened after the, the release of this album. Oh, Again, it, every it time happens, a Taylor it, Swift it, 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 fan it, discovers Goblin, an angel gets their wings. It, it happens with any <laughs> big artist, especially like a provocateur, provocateur like Tyler. Any time yeah. that anyone, any any time there's any kind of like broad positive, you know, reaction to anything that they do, you'll mm, get this yeah. kind of stuff dredged up. Um, and and Yo, to Tyler's Abel credit, Ferrara movie is doing really well at Cannes. Have you seen the Driller Killer? Like the things he does in that movie. <laughs> to Tyler's Sorry, credit, um, right? Not to he doesn't not to dignify some of the kind of stupid shit that he's this gets thrown at him but he does go above and beyond just saying like you can't cancel me he does go on beyond he goes yeah, like specifically absolutely. mention things on this song that he said on twitter like as he said some really 
really not great <laughs> shit to Selena Gomez on Twitter at a certain yeah. point, and he acknowledges that on the song. Like he, he's Tegan very, and Sarah. Yeah, Oof. he's very like level headed on the song in terms of righteous indignation for the way that he's treated in this hypocrite with in this hypocritical lane, lens. Like you expect me to have this very this very you expect me to have this specific viewpoint you want me to express in this specific way. Um, and then these specific words because I'm black. Not only you expect me to have that, but also you expect me, Tyler the Creator, to have that. Like, like, and you know, he's a very specific kind of artist. And so there's like these two different kinds of indignities. One is expecting him to espouse certain rhetoric because he's black, and expecting him to espouse certain rhetoric, even though he is this specific kind of artist who is interested interested in provoking, not like warmly massaging. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's the thing yeah. that is so great about the song. Is it made me think of the discourse I saw when Tyler started being more open about his sexuality, right? Oh, that was um, a dark fucking time to be on the internet. And a lot of people, like, the, and some articles that were like, does the queer community even want Tyler the Creator? And my answer to that is, it's like, it's, it's almost exactly what you're saying, but in relation to sexuality, where it's like, just because you have this very, like, sheltered liberal idea of what like a queer person is and how they are allowed to talk about their own feelings about their own sexuality you are then saying that you expect me to go with you even asking the question as to whether this guy counts or is allowed to be part of the club because of things he said as a kid like, like what are you going to do be like hey get out of here no you, you don't get to stay at the lgbtq hotel like yeah, you're gonna exactly. are you gonna suddenly make him stop being bi or gay? Like what the Yeah, and, and another thing I love about this song is that um he in referencing kind of like the, the place that he's come from and the you know the stuff that he said you know that is stupid and stuff and is getting weaponized against him and it's all was all you know was disgusting all that sort of shit but it was like very clearly like shallow bravado mm -hmm. on those early records yeah. and stuff yep. and it doesn't it doesn't it's nothing is really of consequence but there's a nice little callback on um this song which i mean i perceive it as a callback anyway it might be a bit of a stretch but like it's a, it's a callback he does say towards the end of the song he says um tell these black babies they should do what they want uh, and and that line specifically reminded me of the classic uh tyler the creator slash odd future track radicals off of goblin yeah which has you know is i'll be honest is one of my least favorite songs that any of them have been involved oh in. it's it's bad just because it's not a good song to listen to but the sentiment in the song is like the core basically like if you had to distill all of odd future to a, a single kind of manifesto like what it represented what what it was important to it this idea of like free expression uh, and just total like unfiltered like as a form of rebellion um, yeah. then it would be in that song and he specifically does say in that song stand for what the fuck you believe in and don't let nobody tell you you can't do what the fuck you want and when he says tell these black babies they should do what they want in the manifesto to me he's directly calling back to that that track mm -hmm. that was at the heart of so much of the controversy that surrounded Tyler at that point in time bringing things full circle here and not 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 um it's like he he you know he understands that some of the stuff that provoked and annoyed people off that of that those early records was shallow and offensive and all that sort of stuff but he doesn't like apologize for being that artist and doing that kind of thing that he's that he did he just takes the core message out of that brings it into the present day and infuses it here in a way that is equally meaningful but more powerful um and more uh i guess yeah it's just it, it's like you take the core idea that's poorly expressed or that is you know rudimentarily expressed in a way that's meant for kids and that song you extract that and you bring it here and it and it has so much more impact anyway banger no, I, track I, 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 I completely agree with you. You, you I, like seriously, I nailed that down way better than I ever could. But I, I think it's interesting that we point all this out, and it's like one of the most 
cited comparisons and someone that Tyler himself has made in is that to the artist Eminem. And when I think about the two of them, they are they occupy the exact same like space in our culture, but the way their careers progressed is in like it's like the yin to the yang is that Eminem yeah. made his like best material when he was being edgy and provocative in that earlier stuff and then he gradually like added more of himself into it and as a result his music became bland and unlistenable whereas Tyler started off as being that sort of edgy provocateur but that it didn't catch on in the way that Marshall Mathers LP or Slim Shady LP did and then when Tyler added his humanity to it and gradually became to unspool himself that's when people got on board with him. It's it's just a complete inverse. And it's, mm. it's why Tyler is like, you know, not to make dumb film yeah. Twitter or film Twitter, hip hop Twitter comparisons here is that like, that's why Tyler to me is a superior artist. If you're going to look at it from like a strictly artistic point of view is that he's just able to do it in a way more nuanced and interesting way than not only Eminem, but like many of his contemporaries. In regards to the specific like expectations of Tyler to say something uh, political in these times, it's like on one hand, it's great to use your platform to promote as much change as you can. On the other, maybe this is almost too reductive, but what the fuck do you think he thinks? like I... <laughs> exactly that's kind of the attitude too is that you, he's just like what do you fu-? it's just like yeah my people are oppressed what do you want me to fucking do you, about it we know we've been new what you're, is... you're the only ones just figuring it out it's, so just, why... it, it, it's just bad faith like it's not about what people want to know that tyler thinks it's about what they how they want him to posture right basically when people say oh tyler you're not saying the right thing or tyler you're going to say something like this it's not because they want him to say something like that it's because they want to you know build a case against him reaffirm it's a bad faith thing. world do it's, it reinforce it it's not that though it's like uh, it's these people don't like tyler they're saying this sarcastically as a way to point out like to try and like own him and say like, it's oh, both. well, you don't do this, so you therefore you're not, you know, you're not, uh, you know, you're problematic. Oh, totally, I don't think those are mutually exclusive at you, all. You, no, your your silent your silent speaks volumes. Anyway, like, <clears throat> come on, it, like you can. I mean, the guy's really popular. He most certainly has uh, people from both camps of like, you know, just just trolls who already hate him trying to like get caught in 4k um, <laughs> and and fans that were are like just discovering racism and are like mm, i i gotta i gotta hear what tyler the creator thinks about this so i can assuage my own potential guilt fucking dave Chappelle last year that comedy special oh he did <laughs> which when is he was why... just like do you care yeah. what ja rule thinks which is why yeah. Tyler's track works so well because he takes the high road on it. He doesn't just yeah. get mad. He offers an olive branch on the song. And it is a song that actually has quite like a, it's quite heartwarming by the time he gets to the end of it. Like ultimately he is saying like, he is saying that we need to come together and, and, you know, I can't actually read the lines that he says because I'd have to censor every other word. But but the things that he says on the song is basically like, we're the same. Let's be the same together. Let's have plans. You know, put this plastic on first because shit is hitting the fan. Like it's like it's 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 both a fuck you to the bad faith people and a genuine like, hey, to the to the good faith people, it's a genuine like, hey, obviously I'm with you. Let's focus on what matters. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it's not, it, he, he takes the high road and he's so like mature in the way that he deals with this, you know, indignity that he is experiencing that it speaks so much about like, you know, Tyler as a person. Okay. Well, I think we've Bridges. done a pretty good job with this one. Um, but Leah, let's move into our favorite tracks and ratings for Tyler, the creators call me if you want to get lost whatever it is uh my three favorite tracks are i'm gonna go with manifesto sweet i thought you wanted to dance and uh lumberjack because i wish a fella would 
I just I, want to say I love that. I love that hook so That's a much. great I line. Can't say it. <laughs> That's a great line. But I love even so more good. Jasper at the end of the song losing his mind because he can't get over that line. He's like, "What the fuck does huh? that mean?" <laughs> He's, he's just flipping the fuck out. It's so good. Um, like he just like he's got that first part. He's like, it's different. It's really different. And then he just gets crazier and crazier with each verse. Uh, but least favorite track, I will say, um, which sucks because this is definitely my least favorite track because it's the lowest rated one I have. And I still think the track is fun, is fucking awesome. But my least favorite track is probably Run It Up. Like the second half of that song is hype as shit first half is like fine but like that's probably my least favorite but i give the album i've been slaving over what to think of this but i'm gonna go ahead and take the middle road and say i'm gonna give it an 8.5 and it could fall on either side of going up or down frankly my three favorite tracks are uh sweet i thought you wanted to dance uh wilshire and um you know what i'll just say uh I'll say Lumberjack, least favorite, probably, uh, I don't know, Safari, Not, don't remember a whole lot about that one, I'd give it a 6 out of 10. My three favorites are Wilshire, uh, Manifesto, and I will, I will say Hot Wind Blows, I didn't hate Lil Wayne, and that's an achievement. Uh, least favorite, yeah, probably say like, Lemonhead. Anyway, that's a seven out of ten. My favorite tracks are, I'm gonna say Manifesto, and I'm gonna say Massa. I'm gonna say Wilshire. Shout out to Hot Wind Blows though. That song absolutely rules and um, pretty great. My I'm least sure. favorite is probably the opener, I guess. I don't know. Um, it's getting an eight for me. My three favorite songs are Massa, Manifesto, and I'll say Corso. Uh, least favorite tracks probably run it up also. I'm giving the record a 7.5. All right. Well, now we'll move on to our second album of the day, which we're going to discuss, which is... So, long-time listeners of this podcast... Real ones know that Lucy is a member of singer songwriter trio Boy Genius alongside Miss Julian Baker and Miss Phoebe Bridgers. Two women we have come out, they have come out with their most recent album. We have covered <laughs> they both have of come them. out, it's true. Lucy here uh, is I think to date, she is the Boy Genius member with the most uh, projects that have come out so far, which isn't to say she's insanely prolific, but she's got more, uh, at least like, I think she's got like four this studio her, records now. This is her third studio album. Third. She's And she's got like an EP or two. Yeah, she's put out some a, like singles. Yeah. So basically, if you don't already know, this is a group that kind of, walks down the tried and true uh, avenue of being, you know, the indie singer songwriters, but every once in a while there's a group or just one artist who will sort of come along and really capture the voice or ennui of the moment. And I think it's fair to say that sort of ever since those first records like uh, Sprained Ankle, Stranger in the Alps came along is that they've rode a pretty steady wave of success. That said, Lucy is the member of this trio that I see talked about the least. Uh, I don't know if that is emblematic of overall popularity. That's just my experience. But um, I would say that her identity as a songwriter that ex- makes her different from her peers is that her music is a little bit more, or at least her lyricism is a little bit more direct. She has a very similar approach when it comes to sort of her vocal timbres. It's, uh, there's sort of a lot of the 
occasionally irreverent, but still very emotional songwriting that you wouldn't find or that you'd find on a Phoebe Bridgers album. But the difference is that Lucy is a remarkably direct songwriter, whereas a lot of people in her position might heavily cloak themselves in metaphor or do a thing where they sort of detach their perspective to view it from a more holistic way is that Lucy has always struck me as someone who is incredibly personable, more so than uh, her two other members. And Historian um, was an album that I think did pretty well. I think that album gets a lot of love for songs like Night Shift, um, which you know generally is a song people like a lot. But this album here um, is the most I've seen people talk about her at all. Sort of the album cycle coming out with singles that are remarkably good, remarkably uh, well-received, like Thumbs. So I know a lot of people who are really looking forward to this particular project. And now we have it. And as is typical of me, I own it on vinyl because I'm a simp, because I'm pathetic. Look at how easy I am. I mean, so justified. I, I think, um, continuing context, I think I might be able to explain a little bit why Lucy is less talked about. And I, I think partly it's to do with the fact that she um, debatably was the last of the three to really come into her own musically. Uh, and also it has to do with, I guess, scenes and the ways in which certain art artists come up and are thrust into relevance in scenes. Mm -hmm. So Julian Baker, for instance, is like the very hard on sleeve confessional, um, not technically emo, but like the appeal is very sort of similar. Uh, a record like Sprained Ankle um, kind of resonated through the underground indie scene, struck a chord with a lot of people, a very direct album. And Julian was putting across a personality that was so like confronting and dark and sad and, and self-loathing. A lot of people responded to it. Also helps that she got um, really buoyed by a lot of the indie blogs as well, like Pitchfork, Stereo Gum, all those kinds of like communities really helped elevate her music. With Phoebe, Phoebe's all like the, the, the th Phoebe's are debatably the most popular of the three. Oh, a lot yeah. of that comes down to personality. Phoebe is incredibly online. Phoebe knows how to get people engaged with her. A, a, a posting um, aficionado, let's say. She's bad at it. Uh, yep. she's, she's great at it from the perspective of getting followers and getting attention yeah. and generating interest and building her fan base. Like um, yeah, That's true. That, that that to the extent that that is her twitter persona is one of the things that is most known about her that people think of generally we're different we're biased we've talked about her music so much that we're a bit inured to that but when you say phoebe bridgers most people think of online personality phoebe bridgers so anyway I that's the way i was not alive that's the way that she has generated her audience. That's the way that she sucked people in as well, as well as her connections with people like Connor Oberst and stuff. So, so yeah, Julian has had the, you know, the indie community and this very kind of stark, unique style that has resonated with people quickly. Phoebe has been just really good at branding and able to build herself up and getting the difference in followers between the two, by the way, is that Lucy's at 80K and Phoebe is at 443. Yeah. So, exactly. so Lucy is different. Lucy is, um, yeah, has been around as long and making music as long as those other two, if not longer, but taken longer to find a, a core musical identity that differentiates her in the way that those other two have, and has also had less interest in, uh, I guess, herself as a personality and her own appeal. She is hands down the writer's folk musician, or like, not folk, but like the writer's indie musician. Like, she is so dedicated to the craft of storytelling and that's not to say that julian and phoebe aren't they absolutely are um but i think a thing that distinguishes lucy is specifically her interest in framing stories um in this really kind of novelistic way that where there's so much of a sense of place and also phoebe often removes herself from the center of the stories in a way that a lot of artists other artists don't there are certainly songs on this record where phoebe where lucy jesus definitely does sing about her own life songs like first time for instance 
um, other songs on the record like uh, Partner in Crime as well. These are songs where Lucy sings about her own experiences. But for the most part, Lucy is telling stories about, if not about people in her life and their experiences that she's close to, but the way that she kind of responds to the world, basically, and the way she kind of... Uh, absorbs and reflects and uh, observes the world around her and takes it in and the way the specific and individual way that she sees things that's very unique and idiosyncratic and her talent as a writer uh, makes that really interesting and really fresh sometimes funny sometimes poignant and always consistently engaging, I think. Now, I have a lot to say about this album, so maybe it would be better if I save my extended thoughts until after most of you have spoken. But I think we've kind of established enough to kind of, like, who Lucy is as an artist to kind of start digging into what this album is. And so to try and, like, uh, architect... Uh, the conversation let's start with the album title like home video the theme of the album the idea of the album what do you guys think home video means and what do you think Lucy is trying to do with this record overall before we get into the stories themselves every song is like watching a VHS tape of a memory with her that's the way at least I mean like the cover obviously kind of indicates that she's on the the theater and you know she's got the little vhs thing there but this is so very like you said that you know phoebe julian not strangers to you know the art of telling a very simple like story in their music but lucy here definitely like this is an album that feels like a um oh what am i thinking of where it's a bunch of short films in one film it's called an anthology an, an anthology yes it's called and it's this is, feels like an anthology more than anything else is that you get this very very vivid portrait of her life not necessarily well her experiences i don't think it's like her life in the sense of like it, it, you get drawn into very very specific memories very very specific instances and stories that she will give really poignant details about and to the point where it almost feels like she is like these movies are like silent and she's explaining them to you in like a theater like that's sort of how in my mind's eye all of these sort of flow together yeah in many ways it, it feels like this grand portrait of the world that lucy has grown up in and mm -hmm. the feelings and experiences whether they're things that have happened to her or things that have happened to friends of hers that have shaped uh her as a person and have led her to the position that she's in uh, i think this record is remarkably well structured in that regard in the sense that you move from story to story but there's great consideration given into the order in which the stories are told for instance you have um, in the, the dotted throughout the record in the second track, the second to last track, and right in the middle of the album are these three specific stories about that are actually not even stories as much as um, Lucy speaking directly to women in her life mm -hmm. and offering them advice and the way that though we can talk about those tracks specifically in a bit but uh, that just to talk about in terms of structure the way that the record is set up to weave you through lucy's life lucy's interactions with other people um i think it's meaningful that each of those songs uh about lucy singing to someone else directly is then followed by a song where lucy is reflecting on a on a um, or, or like bookended or surrounded by songs where Lucy is reflecting on and if something important that happened to her or reconciling something that happened to her. And then at the heart of the record, you also have the track Going, Going, Gone, which is this, um, she has Phoebe Bridgers and Julian Baker on this track as well to sing this kind of like familial hymn. Just so much to dig into here in terms of both the way this record is laid out and then what Lucy is singing about on it. Yeah, um, I, I like this record quite a fair bit. I th think in terms of the sonic palette, it's a step up from Historian in terms of the range. On the, upon a first listen, I, I was almost like braced to the point of alienation 
with how intensely personal all of these stories are. Like on the song about a partner or friend who uh, sort of destructive, abusive father requests a meeting. That was uh, fucking harrowing. And it's because she eschews poetic frills in favor of just telling you what happened. And it's, it's, it can be very hard going at points, but upon multiple listens, like, it's like, uh, <laughs> like the most difficult stories. If you force yourself to stay there, there's a lot of re- very rewarding qualities to this method of songwriting, you know? Um, there's a lot to say about the human experience on this album. There's a lot to say about relationships and, and trauma and sadness. And it says it eloquently without feeling the need to dress it up. And I think that's worth a lot. Yeah, just um, to come back to that kind of home video idea, there is, like a, you know, a real sense of, of I don't know if, if nostalgia is the right word to use, but you feel like you're diving into these very specific memories that Lucy has. And that wouldn't work if the way that she wrote didn't so powerfully and effectively put you there like it's so immersive the songwriting on this record and I think when you when you look at a song like Thumbs which obviously stands out from especially with how hard of the record how still it is instrumentally how focused you are on Lucy's voice and how emotionally charged that story is it works not just because of those things but because Lucy has the ability to put you there, even if you don't have any sense of where you can relate specifically to the story, although Lucy does a great job of, of you know, doing that great songwriter thing of making it all feel universal. But like, even without that, Lucy just has these details that give you this in- incredibly emotionally intense sense of place like for instance if we're gonna zero in on that song and i'm not surprised that it's come up quickly because like i say it's a song that is so startling but like the detail in that song of he ordered a rum and coke and i can't drink Mm. either anymore um and just um the the detail of her friend's nails digging into her leg Um, The way in which you get a sense of Lucy's train of thought moving in real time, like thinking about the the relationship between her friend and her father, how they're connected, then drawing that into his eyes, which are the most vivid physical thing about him that they cannot, you know, that's that are right there burning into Lucy and her friend as they sit together, thinking about his eyes in the context of how they connect him to his daughter in terms of you know the genetic connection and then Lucy feeling the hand of her friend on her knee digging into her and then imagining her own hands digging into the eyes of her friend's father the way this whole scene is laid out in front of you and you every single detail is both stream of consciousness emerging from the previous detail and also totally refined in the way that Lucy expresses it so that it's just perfect. Um, The way that she withholds information and the way that she reveals information, like the, the, the details she gives in terms of describing leaving the situation you know, leaving the bar and ending on that line of you feel him watching so we walk a mile in the wrong direction. That's just great storytelling, writing in terms of the way that you withhold and then devastatingly reveal this additional piece of detail that reflects and adds to the experience. It's so fucking good. The way that Lucy is so obsessed with the fact that she can't understand how her friend is able to keep smiling through all of this she says that over and over and over again i don't know how you keep smiling and you really feel that and what's great about this song is that it's not a song about having a shit dad we've got plenty of those songs phoebe bridger's kyoto is a a fantastic maybe the quintessential example of that it's 
it's more it's different to that this is a song about having a friend with a shit dad and it's a the song about mm-hmm. compassion and empathy and being in a position where you don't know what to do you don't understand a lot of songwriters try to write in a way that is like it's trying to convince you that they understand the worst pain in the world and lucy is not afraid to admit that she does not understand what her friend is experiencing but she still loves her friend and she still will do anything for her and she still feels the emotion itself radiating out of her friend so much that she would want more than anything with permission to fucking rip his eyes out of his skull that is fucking how you write a song it's genuinely like one of the most harrowing songs i've heard this year and it's like volume wise it never gets above like you know a soft whisper really the the part of it that i love the most is the very end where she talks about taking her friend by the head and saying that you know you're related by a cosmic coincidence you know the blood uh, is the only thing that connects you and it's all relative and like just that moment of just like the the whole it's a microcosm for the whole album which is really about like you s- said it yourself with the this word of choice being compassion specifically the burden of compassion and how it's like acknowledging that like i don't understand the deepest sadness or the most painful pain on earth but what i do understand is trying to reach out to and help and support someone else who does feel that and i don't know how to And that's a really, really specific emotional beat. And I think if anybody's ever had a friend that struggled with anything before, you will not only find thumbs poignant, regardless of whether or not you have a shitty dad, it's written from a perspective that makes the situation, the emotional journey that the characters are going on, that's what you relate to. You don't relate just because of the content, you relate because of the context, which is like the most important thing about Lucy's voice on this album and to speak on her voice on a more literal level on this song across the whole album uh like i love the vocal presence of each member of boy genius individually for very very different reasons i think julian has the most powerful voice i think phoebe has the most subtle and understated voice and i think that lucy and this might sound a little reductive but i'll I'll say a couple other things about it but like she has an incredibly sexy voice. She has a smoky, very, very, like, it's a little bit deeper, but it's silky smooth. And all over this album, she knows exactly how to fucking use it in the best way possible to the point where it both comforts you and on thumbs kind of disturbs you because of the content, like the dissonance between hearing this voice just say, you know, like talk in this really, really even timbre. And then she says, I'll kill him for you. I'll push in his eyes until they burst. And there's so many moments on this record that do that. And it creates this like a harmony of dissonance that makes this album feel so much more unique than your typical run of the mill singer songwriter records. And it only becomes more apparent on re-listen when you listen to things like the production, when you listen to things that are typically so understated on albums like this that they might not even like matter to you because you focus so much on the songwriting and the vocal presence. But I think of the people who understand how to do, how to have the, uh, the production complement what they do, Lucy might be the most adept of the three of them at knowing how to use the accents and the emphasis that like all of these instrumental tones can provide and that like this album does that better than like god fucking any album i've heard in recent memory i mean jesus fucking christ also yeah um i have daddy issues and that song makes me sad but like jesus it's it's harrowing even if you if i didn't like it could be about anything and i would say it's like riveting but as someone who does not have daddy issues but can name you at a minimum five friends who have at best somewhat fraught relationships with their dads yeah i i never this is not something i ever thought i would hear a song about and yeah because it's just like 
this is the kind of thing that sends you into like a blind rage if you think about it for too long instead of like the the very complex sort of layers of emotional discomfort that actually being the person with the shit dad uh experiences Mm -hmm. uh because like from my perspective it's pretty much just one emotion and it's it involves violence (laughs) and Mm -hmm. i just uh and it, yeah, it, it relates to another song on this record as well, which explores, you know, it's not as emotionally charged, but it's a sort of a similar thing of like, you're witnessing a situation happening between two people, one of whom you really care about, and you want to be able to intervene, but you also like are, are dealing with this distance. And that's the song Christine, the second oh, song on this record. Hell. We're, um, uh, we're Lucy. I love this song so much. Lucy is talking about essentially one of her closest friends. And again, she immediately starts this song with what something that all great songwriters can just instantly do by putting you in the scene. It's not about starting a song with the, this grand sentiment that gives you this poetic feeling. It's about putting you in the scene so you're instantly there. You're falling asleep on my shoulder in the back of your boyfriend's car. We're coming home from a sermon saying how bent and evil we are. I try to imagine what you're dreaming. You're muttering nonsense between steady breathing. I have to wake you up to get out. That, that, that's how Lucy starts the song. It's not about like, you know, that, that's, that's directness, as Jake was talking about earlier. It's like not r- wrapped up in metaphor or layer or pretense. It's her simply putting you in there. And she, what makes her one of the greatest songwriters of her generation is that she doesn't need to rely on tricks to do that. She can just say those things, put, put those words together in the right way, and you're there. You're in the car with them. Um, I mean, in this instance, you know, it's a second person song. So you're the listener in a sense is um, being sung to. Um, and yeah, Lucy paints this scene where it's, and it's again, the emotional complexity of this song is great. She talks a lot about relationships on this album and she gives them so much emotional complexity that a lot of other singers don't like on partners in crime for instance when she's talking about being in a relationship with an older man it's not this two-dimensional story about like her being taken advantage of or whatever she freely admits in that song that she entered into that relationship knowing you know understanding what she was doing and into that relationship and it was fine and it's not a you know traumatic thing for her like it's a real emotional a level of emotional complexity to how these re- kinds of relationships work that doesn't really get, you know, you don't really get in a lot of songs. But anyway, back to Christine. Um, it, and so the emotional complexity here is her, her friend is in this long-term relationship with this man who Lucy doesn't like. Lucy gets the wrong vibe and Lucy does not want the relationship to go ahead. And the, the emotional complexity here is, it's not that this dude is unequivocally a bad dude. There is really nothing about the song that suggests that. The song is about Lucy's fixation. The song is about Lucy coming to terms with the way that she feels and maybe whether even the way she feels is rational at all. I think some telling external information that Lucy gave about the song is that um, the, the couple in the song, a real couple, it's not a fictional song, they're still together, he's changed, they've changed, and I don't feel the way I felt in the song anymore. They're in a better place, but at the time I wrote this song, it felt very urgent to me that she got out of that situation. So this song is Lucy reflecting on the complexity of the situation uh, and, and about how her friend has themselves said that, you know, he's not the person I thought he was, um, and you know, it, it, or it's not, he's not what I had in mind specifically is what he said, what she said, which is a totally different thing. He's not the person I thought he was. Um, and it, it's a song about, you know, feeling a certain way about a situation that you have no right to control, that you can't control, but that nevertheless is very emotionally charged to you. And that's this, that's an idea that again, like you don't get this level of complexity in exploring that idea. Like Lucy gets across the fact that, you know, she has no real basis for the way that she 
feels and is even conscious of the fact that the way she feels might not be rational but that she still feels that way all the same and in that outro to the song she just doubles down on it she says like if you get married i would object throw my shoe at the altar and lose your respect i'd rather lose my dignity than lose you to somebody who won't make you happy so yeah it's it's very emotionally charged but also like you don't you get the sense of ambiguity in it you don't know the situation all you know is how lucy feels it's the same as with thumbs we don't know the situation between lucy's friend and thumbs and her father all we know is how lucy feels and what lucy wants to communicate and lucy's attempts to understand i want to point out something about this song and it could be about anything is that you you very, very acutely pointed out that it's like these like relationships that the album and that Lucy speaks on are so like nuanced and complicated. And I think that's, there's two reasons as to why. One is because she never explicitly defines them. And the reason that I say that she doesn't define them, that's not like a bad thing. See, for me, it's interesting because I think you can read songs like Christine or songs like thumb, uh, Thumbs. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying that this is the intention, but I'm saying that it definitely relates to this experience is that I think you can highly debate whether or not this is an, ex an explicitly queer song. And not even if it's written, even if it's written with that intent regardless, or if there's no romantic thing at all, that's like, yeah, totally sure. But also the position you're being put in of maybe being in love with someone so much so that you have to sort of watch them, you know, marry and, you know, objecting to that. It's just like, to me, that's like, it could be a friend, but it could also be someone you're in unrequited love with. And there's a depth there. It's not about a lack of specificity. It's just like, we don't know. And every time I listen to it, I just kind of lean one way or the other, but she focuses so much on how like, the, that last verse is really, really great. And I love it. But my favorite part of that song is the one before it, where it says, you always wanted to raise a baby by the lake. Maybe they'll grow up and never make the same mistakes. Knowing you, they'd be the first kid to never hurt another. I see you look at him and wonder if he'll make you a mother. And to me, first of all, that breaks my fucking heart. Uh, like, like Lucy sings this with such like, with like a very specific level of detachment to the point where it feels like she's forced herself to look at it this way. And I'm just like, you can tell that like it, it really does get under her skin and it could be that you just don't want to watch your friend go and live this very you know be absorbed by this american malaise but it also could be i'm in love with you and i want you to be happy and maybe she's reckoning with the feeling of i could make you happy or someone else could make you happy yeah. or maybe i'm projecting i don't know and the same thing could be applied to thumbs like i could also read that as like her and her partner or whatever maybe they go to meet this person and maybe the the deep connection that they have is because of that and maybe they have to if she is romantically related to this person maybe that pain that sort of you feel of having to watch someone go through that is sort of intensified or even magnified by that and like I mean Morgan said it best of just like I almost not not to be too fucking Charlie Day Pepe Sylvia about it but I really do view this album as like almost a, a yin and yang to Punisher because Punisher is about being the emotionally dependent person. It's about being in the shoes of the person who is at the disadvantage. Like Punisher is about Lucy's friend in Christine. Whereas home video is what it's like to be around the person who would be the basis for something like Punisher. And that is such a, like, it's, it's a really unique take, but it's also one that is full of depth. I think you can also apply this to a song like um, most notably Please Stay. Yeah, I was going to bring that one up next. Yes. I, I, again, you know, I have the vinyl Boy Genius person. I, I, I obviously, I love this record and picking a favorite song is very, 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 very hard in a way it hasn't been since Punisher. Um, but God damn, I think it might be my favorite song on the album. And it's, it's just because it's raw, bleeding earnestness mm -hmm. of just wanting someone to stay alive. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, I can't even bury the lead here. It's just like, if you have friends who have struggled with these problems and you've had to go through witnessing them doing that, and it's like, 
you know, a, not to fucking go back to this bullshit again, because I hate it, but it's like when you spend a year of your life indoors away from people and you constantly listen to how miserable they are, it makes an album like this feel really fucking intense, especially yeah. when it's just like, like you can just feel the, the palpable tension of God, I would do anything to help you and save you. And I just can't fucking do it and this yeah. song is just such an earnest outcry and i love it yeah i, I am glad uh, you brought it up because yeah again i see this these three songs as a trinity the second the middle same. and the second to last song and please stay is again it's very similar to christine in the sense that um i don't like what you said about the ambiguity of christine right because i that's the thing about that song is that Lucy never explicitly states how she feels in that regard. Like it could be a gay song, it could not be a gay song. What makes her the what makes it a great song is the fact that we don't know and we can read either way, um, and we can relate to it either way. That's the best part. Yeah, exactly. Even the possibility that it's sort sort of both and not yeah both at yeah the same exactly time. absolutely. Like, there's there's such a like I think one of the key things that really proves someone's metal as a songwriter is the ability to be ambiguous without being vague mm. because you know i hate when songwriters are trying to be ambiguous and end up just writing about nothing mm. by by way of leaving out so many details that they sort of can be saying anything and in so doing say virtually nothing and you know people like uh john prine towns van zandt and pretty much any of the great americana uh songwriters uh fuck it just invisible um all do this really well and i think each member of boy genius does it very well uh to varying degrees but i think lucy might be the best at it okay. like something agree. like thumbs yeah yeah is a, a testament to that because it's not just storytelling and songwriting that makes somebody like John Prine so great. It's the the ability to be specific in such a way that you can read pretty much anything. You can fill in your own gaps entirely into certain songs. Just mm -hmm. fill in your own emotional responses, your own life experiences, and sort of make yeah. it about you. That really makes just the like the best songwriting there is uh more recent examples i would say this album often reminded me of home like no place is there in the way that it was yeah. able to sort of particularly from the uh, perspective of just pure uh sympathy and empathy um from a sort of like outside looking in perspective of someone who is really suffering and comparing it we're not really comparing it but like analyzing its relationship to your own suffering as just watching it happen to someone you love I, I i completely get what you're saying morgan i think everything you've said from ambiguity without vagueness and to those specific references to being at a distance and stuff is encapsulated in a song like please stay uh how you get ambiguity without vagueness incidentally is detail that's the missing piece of the equation and damn right that, that's what as i i completely agree morgan lucy is the best at it uh, Please Stay opens with, again, like those other songs, immediately place detail that puts you in a certain place and detail that is un is kind of uncomfortable. I mean, for me personally, because of how uh, Im immediately it reminded me of, you know, my own fucking flat. It opens with your clothes in the dryer, your hair on the shower wall, your toothbrush is too much, your shoes empty in the hall your keys on the counter, your dirty dish in the sink. So again, all of these images of this scene that you're immediately put into, and then the fucking barb that comes directly after it, please don't make me see these things. Oh yep. God, it's like she get, she puts you right there first. And then the twist is that she's making you see these things that she doesn't want to see. Um, and so this is essentially a song, it is a song, as you've said, Jake, about, you know, not <laughs> wanting someone to stay alive, wanting someone to not hurt themselves, but more, more than that. And again, where it gets into that level of, uh, you know, where Lucy goes beyond is that it's a song about 
not really getting it and not knowing what to mm -hmm. do because what lucy does in the song is she tries her best to be a good friend but she isn't really approaching this situation the best way that she could she's really acting out of desperation more than anything else like the sentiment she expresses on the song she is very clearly a, a genuine love and there's that word again compassion and for her friend but she is you know she's just acting primarily from her place of um discomfort and uh desperation like the attitude of the song is i don't know what to do to get you to not hurt yourself and i am basically going to um say anything i can um and so it's like it's a, it's it's this real complicated thing where it's like both this genuine and meaningful and empathetic understanding but also like distance and not knowing what to do and maybe even not really helping the way you think you are it, it's it's really complicated and and i think in introducing that scene and then saying don't please don't make me see these things which is a very emotionally charged line um she and then the rest of the song builds on that uh, core idea, but right away in that opening, you get a sense of of where what the song is about and where Lucy is coming at coming from it at. One of the kind of core songs of this record that I suspect maybe some of you will have some feelings about, uh, in terms of uh, I think maybe one of the more definitive songs in terms of Lucy as a songwriter. And I think some of her strongest writing is the song VBS, mm -hmm. uh, which stands for Vacation Bible Vacation School. Bible School. Uh, hell <laughs> yes yeah, essentially it, it just it yeah. basically like if even if you're not an american you will completely understand what it's like because you've heard vbs and i think that all three of us can attest to the fact that something like the lyrics that really got me where i'm just like wow that is absolutely something that happened to me was in the evening everybody went to worship and weep hands above our heads reaching for god back in the cabin snorting nutmeg in your bunk bed where you were waiting for a revelation of your own which again um again secretly confirmed gay but you know whatever but the the the, the little like anecdotes of just like i feel like when you get older and you remember vacation bible school you broadly remember it as like 95 percent of what morgan just described it as which is like you know hell and then the remaining five percent are these really really specific and kind of warm memories you have of like the one person you liked who you got to hang out with and spend like 20 minutes with next to the cooler or whatever or when you snuck off and like grabbed some fucking capri suns and drank them underneath the slide on the playground or fucking whatever and it's it's just full of cute little details like that that build this like a picture perfect capturing of the exact environments they're in. Like, I don't know what specific sect Lucy grew up in of, of Christianity, but as someone who experienced both Southern Baptist and Catholic upbringings, um, it's, it's very just, you know, it, it's very down to earth. It's very fucking like talking about bad poetry and doing all this stuff. And it just captures this youthful childlike verve so well i just i literally feel like i'm 10 years old and sitting there and being like god i can't wait to go home and play pokemon it's, it's great it's a great yeah, song it's a great song so i i've thought about this song a lot i mean fucking big whoop i've thought about the song a lot this week um and in terms of like why it's a great song uh and and i think to a certain extent like so I, I don't want people to get the implication from what I've said so far that all you need to be to do to be a great songwriter is like portray a scene vividly. Lu Lucy does that, but Lucy basically explains what VBS is and explains the impact of it and explains the place of it, I guess, in her life without really even talking about anything that happens at VBS. Like she mentions a couple mm -hmm. of things like the lines Jake mentioned. Uh, this is primarily a story about a relationship that Lucy had um, with a boy at VBS. Um, inc incidentally, it opens with what I have to say is one of the most classic lines, opening lines of a song mm -hmm. of years. Yeah. In the summer of 07, I was sure I'd go to heaven, but I was hedging my bets at VBS. What I a fucking classic... love that lyric so oh, much. So, hedging my bets so at VBS. Good. What a great, like, <laughs> instantly memorable line that is. Um, and so... <laughs> Basically, yeah, VBS oh. is what it is. You've all described it really, really well. Um, 
but but the song is kind of Lucy explaining that through telling the story of this relationship that happened to happen at VBS basically and this relationship is with this troubled boy who yeah as Jake mentioned with the lyrics that he quoted you know snorting nutmeg in his bunk bed and lost essentially um uh clearly you know, the alley sheedy of her friend group playing playing slayer you know at full volume to drown out the beating of his heart because he can't sleep at night um and she That's gives these great details again some fantastic wordplay here as well your dad keeps his sleeves down through the summer for a reason your mother wears her makeup extra thick for a reason when i tell you you were born and you are here for a reason you are not convinced the reason is a good one. That's so elegant, the way oh, that she God. writes that. It's so like the, <sighs> the use of the for a reason um, repetition and then the way that she kind of subverts it with the last line. Um, and like, it's giving you this incredibly detailed portrait of this boy's life without spelling out any of the things that have like necessarily put him where he is now. It just gives you this extra information that you can then infer from it a lot of detail. It, it's great. And so basically, it's not just that she's giving you this information to tell you about this boy. She's giving you this information because her perspective in this song is that she wants to understand this boy. She's focusing on, on all of these things. And ultimately, she's trying to save him. She's trying to make you know, she's trying to help him be better in her, you know, naive, you know, childhood, a uh, savior complex way. Like she is, yeah, yeah that was there for you, Jake. Um, Thank you. But like she, that, that's what she's trying to do. She's trying to, she's trying to save him. She's trying to help him. She's convinced that she can, you know, fix him, you know, to use, to borrow a meme. Um, and so that's why she says, that's why, again, the song is in second person. She is like, a th she's pretending, she's acting like a therapist or like a, you know, a, a preacher or whatever, telling this person about their life, convincing them that they understand. Um, and then ultimately, the thing that really gets me about this song is that Lucy's ultimate conclusion is that she can't fix him and she isn't able to do that. Um, you say that I showed you the light, but all it did in the end was make the dark feel darker than before. That is Lucy, you know, conceding her naivety and then acknowledging the truth of the situation that ultimately she isn't able to make this person's life better because she's a kid at VBS and she can't do anything. Um, and also, it's an analog for VBS. I showed you the light, but all it does in the end was make the dark feel darker than before. It's an analog for how Lucy experienced VBS as well, and ultimately her relationship with Christianity, which is complicated. Um, she neither rejects it outright nor is, you know, devoutly Christian. She has this relationship where these experiences with it have led her to a place where it doesn't make her see the light. So it's this multi-layered story that is both telling about this biological experience that she had, uh, revealing about her state of mind at this particular point in, in her life as a young, as a teenager, this particular home video, uh, and also commenting on this force of Christianity that was a huge integral part of her childhood. It's just a fantastic songwriting. <laughs> and yeah, and also like something I haven't really talked about yet because I was I was going to circle back to it but the songwriting is so like you know immediate that it takes a back seat is that I think the instrumental quality of this record is, is excellent as well it's an excellent Locking sounding standing performed indie rock record and the use of the instrumentation on VBS is a great you know jumping off example it's really colorful uh it's really intimate uh, and then that point near the end where she mentions playing Slayer to drown it out and the fucking fired yes. out guitars just come in at that point. It's great. Uh, it's great storytelling musical analog. Yes, there are parts of this record that are much more musically and instrumentally sparse, but I think that's always for a reason uh, as I'll get into uh, 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 talking about those songs. But yeah, just, I, I think VBS is a great song to zero in on because to me, everything that's great about Lucy is here on display in this song um just absolutely stellar track 
there, there's a moment on Christine too, where it's kind of like, there's like these little ideas that will only show their head once. It's like when she, at the end of that one verse where she goes, and that's where we disagree. And then she takes that last one and goes on forever. And then it kind of like the production just sort of takes it. It makes it sound more ethereal. And it's just like every song has like one moment like that, where it just really like takes the wind out from under your wings. It's like, it's just toss a little reverb on the word disagree as it goes into the instrumental. I'm like, my God, I see the matrix. Mm. He's beginning to believe. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and that honestly that gives me another awful. jumping off point to talk about another aspect of this record um and i mean in terms of the marriage of you know lucy as a performer and the music on this record um a track that i, I might be controversial because of a very specific um choice that's made on in terms of how mm. the vocals are produced oh. but partner yeah. in crime um, I, I specifically bring this up because you mentioned the vocal reverb of, of a line kind of like drifting into the instrumental and Christine and there's this great part in, in Partner in Crime where um, uh, so incidentally um, this song is Lucy's voice is lathered in autotune on the song and there is a an incidental reason for that and then there is a specific reason why she kept it and did, as opposed to re-recording it once. So her voice um, was, you know, off one day. And so they used auto-tune and obviously they could have re-recorded it, you know, a different day when she was, you know, when her voice was working, but they decided not to. And there's a reason for that. But um, the detail that made me jump into this is that there's a great moment in the song where Lucy's processed voice kind of like, bleeds into the guitar solo of this song and it's like holy mm. shit moment it's like oh my god it's almost as like as though like because often guitar solos are used in music to convey an emotion that the singer can't put into words right that's the idea like not that's not exclusively how they're used but a lot of the time you think of them in that way right it's this extra burst of emotion through the guitar and lucy deploying one here is beautifully synchronous with the song because it feels as though it is coming out of her voice because of the way that her voice is treated on this track it feels even more like a logical extension rather than just slap a guitar in there and make the audience connect the emotion of the guitar with the the singing it's just this beautiful sense of flow in this song the thing about partner in crime that makes it a good song to discuss off of the back of vbs is that it's also a song about lucy being in a relationship uh and about and you know we're so we we garner we learn something significant about lucy uh, and about her life through this story, basically. Uh, and I think it's Lucy states in the story that, so the point of the story is she's in a relationship with an older man and she's a teenager, I think, is the implicit um, detail. And she says in the song that she deliberately lies about her age uh, and she's clear in the song. And again, I talked about this earlier where in, in terms of emotional nuance. It's not a song about being taken advantage of. And it's also not a song that says that just because I wasn't taken advantage of, this relationship was okay. It's a song that concedes that this relationship shouldn't have happened and it wasn't right. But also at the same time that Lucy doesn't regret it. Lucy, if anything kind of values it as an experience that's helped her to understand herself more and grow. You were my partner in crime. It was a welcome waste of time. Uh, it's this, that's a beautiful way of framing this. Um, and I, again, the sense of the details that she uses in the song, drop me off at the curb by my curfew around the corner so nobody sees you. You drop a hint that you've got a girlfriend. I tried my best not to take it. I want to run my fingers through you you say nobody understands you like I do. I love that line. I want to run my fingers through you, right? Because it's a, it's a subversion of that like cliche of I want to run my fingers through you through your hair in terms of like wanting to, you know, um, hold someone and, and, and celebrate their beauty or whatever. But run my fingers through you is Lucy. Again, you get a sense of Lucy, the amateur psychologist. Lucy, the mm -hmm. person who is valuing this relationship for a number of reasons, one of which is the, uh, you know, the, her interest in people and how this is giving her more exposure to that and letting her and allowing her to kind of understand more people. So, and, and she's, you know, self-critical that, that that is, you know, not a great way to treat people. And part of the reason why this relationship, part of the many reasons why this relationship 
wasn't built to last. Um, but yeah, the, the use of the vocal processing is interesting because the point is that it echoes Lucy's lie that she tells in the song about the fact that she, she says she's older than she is. Lucy, in a sense, is putting on a persona in multiple senses. She's putting on a persona in the sense that she's pretending to be older so she can be in relationship with this guy. And she's also putting on a persona in the sense that she's like treating him like a psychologist would. And a lot of the things that she, in the way that she talks to him, in the way that she talks about um, you know, perceiving him and thinking about him and understanding him. And so the vocal manipulation reflects Lucy's performance uh, that is in a way that's specific to this song and not other songs. And that's why it works for me. But I'd be curious to hear what you all think about this track. Well, uh, I had a bit of, uh, not distance, it was just like, it was a choice that was being made. And I was just like, this doesn't necessarily bother me. I just don't understand why it's being implemented. So I listened to it more and more and I'm like, okay, what's, what effect does this achieve? And it's like, it really stands out from the rest of the record because her voice is obviously, you know, so different on that song. And she doesn't really like, you know, exercise that, that range too much just because it's so perfectly suited to what she's doing. And I was just like, okay, so it does that. And I'm like, is that a good or a bad thing? And I ultimately came down on the fact that I think it is a good thing because the sort of the more personal and direct, like, you know, she's the one who's directly emotionally involved in the song. She's not like, it's not like her friend. It's not like Christine or, or, or Thumbs where she's kind of like a third party. She's a participant in it. So when you have that sort of vocal thing and it's, you know, the processed vocals, it feels alienating and I think that's on purpose because it's sort of demonstrating a fundamental lack of connection there like she's doing the whole you know do you love me do you not do you love me do you not and there's just like they keep you know butting heads in a way and it serves a very similar purpose like this is a uh, Lucy's moon song very very similar themes being uh, going at each other they're similarly kind of sparse and they sort of have like a lull of, of energy on the particular you know place in the record they suit. And I think this one does it very well. I, I sort of like, at first it was just like, sonically speaking, this is just a weird thing to do. So I was just kind of like, okay, I don't know if in the long run this is going to sit well with me or not. And eventually it did, but it's also a choice that I can understand being kind of disruptive to the flow. Like I think it suits a thematic purpose maybe better than it does a sonic purpose but at the end of the day I still just love the song so much that it it really doesn't matter whether or not this particular element succeeds or fails more than one side or the other for me but I, I do come down positively on it even if I do understand the apprehension so another song I want to talk about is uh, it kind of relates to the theme of, of partner in crime and VBS more closely VBS I think uh, in the sense that it's another kind of similar sort of relationship except with a slightly different um dynamic is the song brando, brando. um yeah. where um lucy essentially talks about um being in this again childhood relationship where she is um you know enamored with or at least interested in this boy for his personality and for you know for the you know the reverence with which he treats her but you know understanding with hindsight that uh he never really knew her like he never really understood her and he never really treated her even like a person uh, he treated her like this thing to be this riddle this enigma women be like thing you called me cerebral i didn't know what you meant but now yeah. i do it killed you to call me pretty instead yeah, exactly. And I, I feel like we've, we've all either known a person like this or been this person at a certain point in our teenage years. So it's a song where Lucy is able to conjure a very specific type of person very easily and also like with humor as well. I think this is one of the more humorous songs on the record. Like there's a real twist in the barb when, when she says, you're in a second story window calling me Stella and I'm laughing because you think you're Brando, but you'll never come close. It's one of my favorite. Rip. Um, it's one of my favorite title reveals yeah. on, on this album Damn. as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> August, um, you were gonna say something there yeah, for a yeah. second. Uh, I just want to say I love this song. I think this song's phenomenal, uh, and it's it's what really. 
kind of tied a lot of this together for me because I think what, because what, what really got caught in my head about this song and this album in general was really just almost the, the pop sensibilities Lucy is able to bring to a lot of these tracks, despite of a lot of the really crushing emotions that she's obviously laying down. She's also able to deliver a song in a way where she's able to make it both fun in, in the, like an instrumental sense. She can conjure these really bouncy, bubbly instrumentals but also contrast that with like really memorable, hard hitting lyrics. And I think for me, Brenda's like the best example of that. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, and that's, that's really what I think sticks with me personally about her as a songwriter that she's able to, to, to make this album and really, I think in a way, uh, Phoebe and, Julian ne don't necessarily do balance out just like the raw hookiness and poppiness of it in a sense where I, I mean I wouldn't say it's like an easy album to listen to but it's an easier album to just like sit through without you know crying in the club yeah <laughs> bopping and yeah. streaming tears yeah I, I, first time I, is a song kind of like that too for me because yeah those drums definitely. it's a really exciting pulse pounding song it's like a rock song it's fucking it, cool right song and yeah so, that's yeah that's like hot I, hot and heavy and first time in particular like the thing that those songs evoked for me musically was the war on drugs yeah fucking, yeah that that and the boy genius style of songwriting more yeah adam granduziel please produce a phoebe album please yeah. <laughs> i would i i i <laughs> oh, would that sound like? um it so, would sound fucking amazing so yeah the songs like first time and hot and heavy we haven't talked about those yet and i'm glad they, they come mm. in here neatly as well first time um is just a fantastic song about um it's mm. about losing your virginity specifically but it's more broadly yep. about um, you know, losing your innocence and kind of uh, stumbling into the world of, of, of growing up and reflecting on that, um, that, that great hook. Again, it's another example of like repetition, like with the for a reason thing that's used in a meaningful way. You can't feel it for the first time a second time. Um, it, it seems like, you know, on the face of it, like, yeah, that's bleed and obvious but like the more that you think about that line the more I guess emotional that, that feeling is but um yeah what do you guys think of this song it reminds me a lot of pedestrian verse I don't really know why but like those drums and the energy on the song I'm just like this makes me think of like fucking uh oh what's the fucking uh uh march death march late march death march that's the yeah. song it makes me think of it's like got the same crunchy kind of drums to it and that same sort of like really sort of raucous sound and i just i just love the details here i love like the lyrical so the sort of prose here like catch my breath to breathe your name i am just the fool you took me for um also uh because you didn't or you gave pure, me your hands because you didn't know what to Hutchison. do with them yeah and i showed you the way even though i'd never been uh and just the whole like the, the like it's so grounded talking about sneaking out of the house and um i must be out of my mind of running out of excuses running out of time it's just like this is exactly what it's like to you know first get involved in a relationship with someone when you're younger and to like discover and explore you know sexuality and to be kind of like bad at it on both fronts like you're just kind of like awkward and fumbling about and it just kind of happens and it's like there, there's like a she doesn't like guilt into it or anything where it, it, it's like oh you know losing your virginity bad but like that sort of sort of lyrical thing where she's just like you you can't or you can't feel it for the first time a second time that there that there is something lost in that and that you know when it's so awkward like this it's a shame because it's like you know that whole oh your first time can't be perfect but that sort of awkward memory is just going to stick with you 
forever like it might with some other people who remember the first time that was very not like not not exactly a hollywood shall we say well it, it almost never is and i think the song why no. this what the song is beautiful why the song is amazing to me is that again it's lucy's emotional complexity it's not a song about like i I'm so nostalgic for this amazing sexual experience no. I had the first time. It's a song about, it is a song about nostalgia. It is a song about looking backwards and thinking about that experience. I think it's quite meaningful to dwell on the chorus, the final chorus here of how will I know if history repeats itself? How will I know when it's going to come back around? Has my face mm. changed? How will I know? I will stay ready for you to take me that in combination with you can't feel it for the first time a second time something i've found myself experiencing more and more uh as i'm 24 now and and especially recently is thinking about the past thinking about like me uh, you know like eight years ago as you age into your 20s your relationship with your memories of being a teenager and of those like you know, um, canonical experiences, whether it be losing your virginity or all those things that happen and or may not happen or whatever happens in your teenage years that kind of like defines your loss of innocence, basically. Your relationship to those memories changes. You, you mm-hmm. both get more distant from them and the emotions that you experience in relation to them shift obviously it all depends on you know the the emotional tone of those experiences to begin with but even like things that might be as you know uh unpleasant or kind of awkward or fumbling or not very good as like a really shitty first sexual experience you know provided it wasn't like a horrific experience but even those kinds of experiences start to become nostalgic in a way that you kind Mm -hmm. of find yourself I guess spending more time thinking about or like missing maybe missing is too strong a word but um your your relationship changes anyway and you the distance between you get more and more conscious of the distance between you now and you then and it just weighs on your mind it's I can't even really explain it in words more cogently than that but this song is about that feeling of about you know the the understanding you understand general ideas when you're really young of like you know you nothing it's never the same you know once you've done it everything else becomes different as you get older but you don't really get it until you are at that point in your mid-20s when it's like you are forced to have distance and it all becomes really alien and um uncomfortable and weird and you miss it but also like you don't think you you feel like you should you're thinking about it too much uh it, it's just a really complicated melting pot of emotions and maybe i'm projecting all of it into the song but to me that's what the song is about it's about looking back and trying to it's all, like it's also like about trying to extract the lesson like looking back and trying to understand what you learned and how you've changed and it, it's just a really great song i don't Maybe think I'm you're projecting. projecting i think that she fucking invites projection with her yeah lyricism. that's what i was gonna say is like it may be i'm projecting all of this into the song chad yes <laughs> like that's what makes her great is that well i mean I, I, honest to god it's kind of what makes all of them great it's it not to go off on a tangent, but I, I re-listened to some Boy Genius projects before this because of course I did, but just to contextualize it a little more. And I listened to Little Oblivions again, which obviously that was now my really love and still love. But the reason that I have trouble with it is twofold. One, because that record is overwhelmingly bleak um, and it's just kind of difficult to swallow. And B is because the lyricism on that is so very specific to Julian and her experiences that it's definitely like, on a way that her previous two albums were not like it was there was clearly a lot of her in those records but it wasn't really like about a specific thing about her it was more impressionistic and i think that all of them to some degree really do invite that kind of songwriting and that's why people like us are so taken with them is that they are you know you can say that like oh you can project it onto anything but you have to have a canvas for the projection my guy like you can't just throw it out there and expect it to hit you know they have to provide you with a solid foundation Mm. literal projector being shot into nothing 
Looks home, like nothing. Home video. You need, yeah, you need a home. screen. <laughs> yeah. Home. Really, yeah. And, and the, yeah, and that's meaningful <laughs> that the album cover, Jake, if you want to hold it up, is, you know, sitting in a movie theater from the perspective of staring at the screen and Lucy is kind of looking back at you as though she is showing you. Um, you know, it's not like... It's, she kind of looks like a ghost. It's very on the nose, but it, it, it's a great <laughs> cover all the same. Um, <laughs> yeah, so... Um, <laughs> uh I could talk about every song on this record and I obviously invite all of you to talk about any more that we haven't already if you want to. Um, I have a feeling you're going to want to move into a specific song here. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I'm just conscious of the fact that I've been talking for a long time about this album and I don't want to, um, I love songs, like, I'll just say it, I love songs like Cartwheel and Going, Going, mm-hmm. Gone. They're, cert- they're not, I, do. I don't love them as much as the highest points of this record, but I don't see them as weaknesses either. They're beautiful yeah. in their own ways. They each have some of Lucy's best lyricism. I'll shout out in particular the lines on Cartwheel, the future isn't worth its weight in gold, the future is a benevolent black hole, uh, which is a great oh. line. Uh, and also on Going, Going, Gone, the whole verse about the sun throwing a tantrum. It wasn't ready mm-hmm. to go just yet. Mother Earth said time for bed. It resisted and the sky went red. The color filtered out like pulling teeth Ugh. out of a cloud. The bloody battle ended. The sun can't break the habit of going down. It's a beautiful, um, again. Fucking pure Tom Waits. That's some oh, That's, that's, that's some the shit. most metaphorical that Lucy gets on the record. It's a description mm-hmm. of a sunset in this very vivid painterly way that then ends up reflecting on, um, you know, endings and the previous verse in the song, which is kind of about, you know, a, a relationship, a nascent relationship and the, you know, complicated emotions of that. And then the subsequent verse about the person in that relationship being 10 years older and being this person who Lucy feels incredible distance from and, and um, is reflecting on how he's changed and become this kind of like husk of a man. And like, there's a lot to say, talk about in that song. And I just don't have the time to get the, into it. The but. ending is really cute where you get to see like the little studio thing. I really, I always love shit like that where it's, you know, she's like, yay. And then you hear the, like the voice and it's just like, oh, oh hey, I get a little oh, window into that. the process. Yeah. I like how that song, the inclusion of that and the lo-fi quality of the way the song was recorded as well, really stands mm. out from the rest of the album in a way that highlights that intimacy. So it's it's a, it's a neat yeah. little production choice. Again, not one of the biggest, best songs on the record, but a perfect example of how Probably the deep cuts favorite. here have plenty of nuances and details to talk about. Um, but... <sighs> Big sigh. I want to talk about the one song that I've been dancing around uh, because it is my favorite song of the year. And it's the song Triple Dog Deer, the seven and a half minute closer of this record. That to me, I said earlier that VBS is kind of like the quintessential Lucy song and that it demonstrates all of the things that she does great in her storytelling and her instrumentation. And I stand by that. But Triple Dog Deer is kind of like the zenith of Lucy as a songwriter and musician so far up to this point in her career. Um, I don't know if I can talk about this song, to be honest. It's, it's a very, again, Lucy probably said the word storytelling 25 times now, but this is the pinnacle of that. And it is the most intimate and detailed because rather than just giving placing you uh, into these specific scenes in a really intimate and direct way, Lucy is kind of embedding you in this story that she is a part of that is real based on real events, um, but also a certain part of it is fictionalized, which is interesting as well. Um, but uh, basically it's a song about a queer relationship, um, but specifically a friendship that where Lucy is, um, and Lucy and her friend both develop feelings for he- each other uh, and are kept apart from each other in terms of developing a relationship beyond that by the friend's mother. Um, I incidentally love, I mean, every single line of the song is, I think, amazing, but um, I love specifically the detail of your mama read my palm, she wouldn't tell me what it saw, but after that you weren't allowed to spend the night. But then the subsequent thing of like, 
little Lucy staring at her hands, um, not able to understand what at all, what information um, this woman got from her uh, and how her hands betrayed her. Um, I never touched you how I wanted to, like Lucy being confused in the sense that she never did anything with her hands that they might disapprove of, and yet not being able to understand that um, this person was able to just read them and, and understand them as a person and then have the power to decide that they don't want this girl with their daughter. And just the way that she establishes this relationship line after line um i mean it's got a group uh, song has another great opening line as well i'm not tired yet we have still have a lot to figure out like what the end of the movie was about anyways um again like it just perfectly puts you into the scene of these two people as well as being a kind of like reflection on um the whole point of the album of trying to try and tying together um you know, these life experiences and trying to find out what the movie is about, like what the point of it all is. Um, a beautiful kind of double layered line there. Again, the details pour in, you're yawning on your couch. I wonder if I overstayed my welcome. The way that, you know, when you're that age, you and someone does something like look like yawn and you care about them and you interpret that behavior in all these different ways and you start wondering what it means. And this is, these lines are just throwaway lines essentially, but they're so filled with rich meaning and significance in terms of putting you into Lucy's mindset of at this age at this younger age again it's meaningful that this is a one of the few songs on the record certainly not the only one but one of the few songs on the record that is basically all for, sort of first person and focused around Lucy's perspective rather than Lucy's observation of another um, and uh and yeah just the development of this relationship again it's never outwardly spoke outwardly stated that you know we're gay or whatever it's just you get the sense of of this connection that they have and then it builds up and up and then the final verses um and just you um hmm, ha, yeah I can't, I, I, uh, I want to read the lyrics of this final verse because they, per, I can't, I feel like I can't explain why they're amazing without actually making reference to them. But I also cannot read them because I will literally break down crying if I do that. I, 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 ju I just can't do it. So there's that. Um, but yeah. I, mean, I, I, can, I, I really want to point out a lyrical moment. It's not the end but it's before that. And this may be my favorite set of lyrics of the year that I've read or that have come across thus far. And it's, oh God, never mind. Oh, fuck. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> when you tell me you're afraid that we may die, I said, so what? Everybody's scared of that. I want you to tell me that you miss me. I want to hold, want you to hold and hurt and kiss me. And then like, I, it, it's not even that these lyrics are like sad or whatever. It's just like, this so perfectly captures what it's like to be in love with someone so much and like to feel that reciprocated love and to just be like, I, I just don't care, like fucking like hurt me. I, I don't care. Like just yeah. as like, as long as I get to have you or you get to have me or well, fucking whatever. This that's is like, it. this all that fucking matters. That's those lines also hit doubly hard because it's the, that's the third middle of the third verse on the song. And it's the first time that it's outright stated that they're in love, essentially in love with yeah. each other, even though it's only still implied there by those lines. Like Ugh. we can, you know, we, we can infer from the rest, the earlier parts of the song, what it's about, but that moment when she simply says, I want you to tell me that you miss me. I want you to hold and hurt and kiss me and really just brings that right to the front is so, so powerful. And again, and then we get to this part where, again, Lucy throughout the song has invoked uh, either a description of things, a turn of phrase, or a selection of images that put you into that childhood scene. And then she brings it again with, I want to run away and live on your family's boat. It, it's a triple title of the song. You get it. You remember the line. I'm sure you all do. Yep. Um, and it's like, yeah it's this genuine feeling and it's it's also this like real like childhood thing and uh, 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 <laughs> i'll go lick the frozen lamp post now yeah yeah 
And so obviously the song escalates and builds to this like as with the repetition of the title to this huge roaring um guitar climax which incidentally is quite is i like that it's brief rather than going on because it is like representative of this fantasy that they're having right and it and it remind the briefness of that explosion reminds you of the fact that it's a fantasy without having to like you know use some kind of blunt lyric to do that um and and the beautiful part about the end of the song beyond that is that um, it indulges the fantasy, right? Lucy, and what I mean is Lucy has outright stated that this whole song is true, except for the very outro where they actually do run away and live together. Like, obviously that part's not true. But the... <laughs> 25th, 25th hour. Uh, the, 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 the roaring climax allows you to, like, feel the emotion of the running away together. And then the outro is this beautiful series of lines. They put our faces on the milk jugs again, real like classical like 90s idea of like the face on the milk carton uh, missing children till they gave up, gave up your mama was right and through the grief can't fight the feeling of relief nothing worse could happen now and this is interesting right this is a switch of perspective into of all people the perspective of lucy's friend's mother um to who is like feeling after her child has run away has gone forever essentially um that feeling of of nothing worse could happen now that feeling of like yeah it's an idea that i feel like has been explored in a lot of songs that we've talked about before this idea of like the kind of that that people who've never grieved or like never like really lot had a, suffered a horrible loss maybe don't understand and that is the 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 feet the weird twisted kind of relief that comes with that of knowing that like you know this is the worst it could possibly get um and and, and it's, a, it's a very poignant note to end on it's kind of fucking devastating um and i don't really think i've processed it yet but I mean, Jesus Christ. Please tell me I'm not alone in thinking this song is amazing. Oh, fuck. What, what, who, do you, who do you think I am? Fuck I mean, it's an it's a eight-minute song on a singer-songwriter album. Probably going to like it. I like my big, long songs. You miss like my heart on Stranger in the Alps. When they're not necessarily you know progressive rock opuses mm. that's always cool when people pull that off and that's fi fucking and that's just from a compositional point of view i i'm not talking about the lyrics i'll let y'all do that because i don't i'm i'm fucked up and i don't want to <laughs> uh you know it's pretty it's pretty pretty good pretty good song august how do you feel about this track as a closure to the record um I, I think it's a really, really interesting way to close out the album, uh, especially with the notion that the last, like the very last part of it is the kind of uh, fantasy of sorts, I guess, because I think, I think that adds a real depth to how the record ends and that you have to consider both the 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 purpose it serves within the album of finally being this this relief this like finally escaping and and being free and and also not having to consider the real world ramifications of of what that truly means because in a, in a sense the characters in the song never have to because it never happened but it's like that it's like the closing cre it's like the end credits rolling up on a screen where you don't have to think you don't really it doesn't necessarily matter what what happens after the credits roll and it's also like a, a thing i think about in real life rather often where where you come to this moment in your life where you you feel like wow this is one of the greatest days of my life ever. 
and then you have to wake up the next morning. That's what this song feels like to me. I That next morning and just having to live on because there there is no true happy ending to anything. It's just you keep going on and going on until you don't. And I, I think that's a really mature, interesting way to end it out on. I think that is a beautiful place to end off our, our lengthy and detailed and pretty comprehensive discussion of this album. Um, should we get away our favorite tracks and readings? Sure. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll um, go, let's, let's go regular order. I'll like to go last. So um, okay. Jake, why don't you go first? My three favorite tracks would have to be Triple Dog Dare, Thumbs and I'm gonna go with Please Stay. Uh, least favorite song, very good song still, but I'll have to go with uh, Going, Going, Gone. Wish that was a little bit longer of a track, if I'm honest, but you know, not exactly the worst complaint in the world. Uh, been gnawing at me for a while as to what I'm gonna give this record, but I've listened to it a lot and I'm just going to do the coward's way out and do an in betweener and give it a 9.5. Beautiful. August. Yay. Uh, favorite tracks are, I'd say, Hot and Heavy, um, Brando, and the last one, which I've already forgot the name of because I suck. Uh, least favorite <laughs> is Partners in Crime, and I'll give it a 6 out of 10. I liked it. Morgan. <laughs> Uh, my three favorites, Jesus. I would say First Time, uh, Triple Dog Dare, and Hot and Heavy, I'll say. I, too, have been struggling with the rating for this. Um, I've, I'm going to give it a nine and say that come back to me when we get to our year-end list, because this is probably going to be different. Okay. Gotta live with it. Um, yeah, Sershus gave it a seven. Um, my three favorite tracks are, yeah, obviously Triple Dog Deer. Thumbs, I'm going to say as well. Uh, and BBS. Um, I don't have a least favorite track, and this record gets a 10 from me stupid fucking year daring to be fucking good how dare it all right well that sums up a very uh, emotionally exhausting episode of the jams and tea podcast let us know what your favorite um what your thoughts were on the records we discussed today in the comments below uh next week we are going to be discussing the new mountain goats record dark in here and we're also going to be discussing the new spelling album um which I actually can't remember the name of, but it's the new Spelling album anyway. So <laughs> stick around for that. Um, also out this week, as we hinted towards at the beginning, at the top of this episode, we will also have a record club on the Metalcore album, Nothing Left to Love by the band Counterparts. And we also have uh, the third episode of our Radiohead retrospective on OK Computer coming at you as well. So stick around for there those. Um, and yeah, that's all. that's all she wrote. All right, and as always, folks, rock over London, rock on Chicago, all state, you're in good hands.